and make sure Ankbot's running. All right, sorry. I know. Uh, let me know if you can hear me, guys. I'm getting back. Uh, we're we're getting set up one more time. Let's put on some music. I know you guys want it. Um, seriously, sorry about the tech issues. <laughs> oh man. Uh, I'm gonna meet myself on Skype. So that's that. Uh, and then I'm gonna mute Skype. If I could find it here. There we are. Um, which one are we? There we are. Okay. Sorry about the, um, yeah, sorry about the delays, guys. Do, do, do. I am good. You can hear. Okay. I'm gonna five minutes I'm gonna get a I'm gonna get a tweet going we're gonna get all this ready and then we are going to be live I swear to you uh, there's my dashboard there is Twitter <laughs> I my computer just went down and I have to re reopen everything that I uh, that I had before oh man glad to have you judo killer thank you for stopping by good to see you chilling with us live at all right. Me, uh, I'm I'm posting a, a a tweet link right now. So, give me just a bit. Oh shit! We got the. Uh, uh, I gotta hold on. I gotta take a screenshot here. There we go. Uh, open this. I'm opening this in paint. I'm literally like, cropping a front page screenshot as we speak because I gotta, I gotta get it done. How are you guys doing? Let me get a retweet link out for you guys. Don't save. Fuck it, can't do it. Okay, I gotta, get, I gotta get a tweet going. This is, this is, uh, this is ridiculous. I know Mike's, uh, Mike's waiting. Don't worry, guys. Don't worry. A new follower. Everything is fluffy. Thank you so much, R Green Paradox. Uh, Twitch.tv slash exploding dice. Yes, front page. All right. Who's tagged in this photo? Wizards is uh, these guys, Mike, and Twitch. There we go. All right, here we go, guys. So um, the tweet is out. Let me get a uh, get a link to that on TweetDeck. Mike or Chris? Oh, probably Chris. He's a uh, he's he's a lot cooler. Is this music loud enough? I don't I don't I feel like it's probably not loud enough. Um, Okay, so Ankbot, guys, there is there is the retweet link right there. Copy that. There is the retweet link. Dice Thulu has it for you. We're gonna be going live in two seconds. Go ahead and tweet that out, and we'll see you on the other side.
What is going on everyone? Welcome to another fantastic Tuesday here on the Exploding Dice channel. My name is Askren. I am your host and dungeon master. Not a dungeon master today, but I am your host and we have a great show for you. First and foremost, I have... Which side is he sitting on? I'm trying to figure it out. He's sitting over there. I have Mike Merles hanging out with me. What's going on, my friend? Hey, how's it going, man? I am flustered and flabbergasted, but we are here, and we're having, we're gonna have a good time. For those of you who don't know, we had some tech issues, uh, and my computer went down, and I had to bring it back up and do all this uh, very, very last minute. But um, we are here now, and if you have not seen it, we're here hanging out on the front page of Twitch because they have decided that we are worthy of representing the Twitch community in their week or monthly role playing game spotlight so uh thank you so much twitch guys for that um let's uh let's change this out we don't need optimus where i'm going on all day but we can use some uh some good tavern music before we have a great show for you guys if you haven't been watching the tweet we have like giveaways we have all kinds of cool stuff happening tonight and before we dive right into that uh, I, I have one or two announcements I just want to make real quick. First of all, if you have not already, please hit that retweet link. Uh, Dice Thulu will have it for you in, like, just a second here. There you go. Add that. There, Dice Thulu has the link for you. A new uh, so go ahead and hit that. Tell everyone you are hanging out here, and it's going to be a blast. Uh, second announcement is, if you guys have not already, uh, please go check out that giveaway. It's just bit.ly slash yawning portal, and you will find our monthly giveaway where I have put together a cool package for you guys. It's got a new copy of the yawning portal book, which is right here. Uh, it's got a, uh, a wormwood dice box, which is somewhere in my desk over here. Uh, and it's got a, a set of dice and a player's handbook to go with it. All of that good stuff that you need to, uh, to get your adventure going. Um, and I don't have the other announcement because my, p the page that I wrote it down on crashed. So that's all for the announcements. Um, but I don't want to ramble too much about that. I want to talk to my new best friend, Mike. <laughs> so, Mike, before we uh, before we dive into it, and while I kind of turn up the music here, tell every when you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, you know what you get up to, your background, all that good stuff. Sure. So uh, I'm the uh, I basically I'm in charge of uh, the Dungeons and Dragons creative team. Uh, on fifth edition, I was one of the two lead designers. I was more on the design side. Crocker was on the implementation side, so I had a lot of like the ideas for what we wanted to do with the classes, how we wanted the game to work, uh, and all that kind of stuff. Um, the I've been at Wizards now for a while, like 12 years, <laughs> and I've been in my current position for about let's see, it's 2017 now, so about five years or so, give or take. So basically, I was kind of there from like when we, you know, I sort of led the initial concept of fifth edition, and then led, led the design work. And nowadays, uh, each year, like things like yawning portals stuff like that i kind of handle the uh the concept like i'll come up with the idea like what do we want this book to be and then i'll weave that into like an annual thing like each year we kind of think of each year as a different unit so each year is a different theme or has different products that are they don't necessarily tie together thematically but they're meant to tie together in terms of like what we know people and dungeon masters want out of dnd i'm also broadcasting live from my house i was homesick today for work <laughs> so you might have a cat and, and that cat's ass come right across the camera at any moment. Hey, or you ever, might hear some dogs in the background. We, um, uh, my, I, that's why I don't let my cat in my room, in this room, because, uh, <laughs> she likes to sit right here on the desk and nowhere else, <laughs> especially while I'm streaming. So she's not allowed in here <laughs> during that, uh, during stream times. Uh, hopefully the volume is fixed, guys. Let me know, uh, how it's going there. Um, yeah, man, definitely. I, th one of the things, and I hope we're, we're going to get into some really cool discussion, because um, I, I have been playing D&D for a very long time, and I am one of those do uh, uh, I'm one of those guys who is really into the concept of, like, uh, I guess game, des game design from a conceptual level. Um, cool. I've talked with some really, really cool people, uh, Adam Koble and Steve Lumpkin and other people like that. Yeah. On like we we delve those issues hardcore because that's just that's just the stuff that turn you know gets us going. Um, cool. Before we dive into hard, some hardcore topics, I want to mention uh, we have a new thing on the overlay. If you guys don't notice, it says giveaway goals down in the corner. Um, 
music is a bit too loud. Cool. I will turn that down for you guys. Um, yeah, the music, the background music, kind of tied to the other volume. Uh, so I'll try and work work on it. Um, but with the giveaway well, goals, oh man, there he is. My cast white. He's all white. Um, so if we hit some of those goals tonight, every time we hit one of those goals, I'm going to be giving away something else uh, for you guys. So we've got um, we've got a whole pile of books and dice and other cool stuff here. And, of course, at the end, we have a big, big giveaway that has been kindly uh, kindly supplied to us by our friends at Wizards. A so if you guys follower. want to be involved in that, you just got to hang out and wait till the end of the show. But every goal we hit here, the retweets, uh, the Game Wisp subscribers, and our monthly donation goal... All of that stuff is going to trigger other giveaways, so definitely uh, get involved in that if you want to win some stuff. And also, if you want to have a really cool way to support the channel and get other cool things that you can help our uh, live play shows in, because we have three of those. Uh, what is going on, Ben from Sirenscape, my good friend? Thank you for joining me, man. Ben, uh, if you guys don't know, Sirenscape makes like the best... Um, uh, tabletop like ambience and background music and and stuff uh they make a program that does all of that and i i love it it's it's fantastic um okay so let's uh let's talk a little bit about because i'm i'm really interested in uh in i guess what obviously fifth edition is is really interesting to me because fifth edition as uh, uh oh sorry before i delve into this one more thing uh guys we are going to be doing Q&A. That's going to be the second half of the show. So if you have any questions or topics that you want me and Mike to discuss, just uh, make sure you keep them in store. Don't don't for think we're ignoring you. We're just going to we're going to we're going to get to it uh, in a little bit and then you can fire away with those. So, all right. So 5th edition, um it w it was I was really interested in the the sort of development process because to me it felt like um, it felt like a really interesting I guess departure from older editions in the sense that it was trying to capture a lot, like a lot of what was going on in other role playing, not necessarily D and D type games at the time, and it's sort of kind of caught the world by storm. Like it's become the biggest thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do do you have any any insight to like where where that came from? What you guys were oh. sort of influenced by, and 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 all that yeah. stuff. So, you know, it's kind of interesting because... A new the, uh, follower. I apologize, I'm sort of trying to fend off a cat. He's oh, no, it's all good. Draping around. No, he's biting. Hey, he's biting. The, and anyway, the... Um, the So, yeah, I think what's happened with role-playing games, uh, and one of the things we sort of saw was, you know, in the 90s and maybe like 15 years ago, you, you think about role-playing games in terms of like these very like specific design things. You know, like... There was this old uh, model. It was like like the GNS model, like gameism, mm -hmm. uh, simulationism, and narrativism. And I think that is it. Really, is has fallen to the wayside. I don't really see many people talking that way anymore. Because I think mm -hmm. what we see now is games, especially role playing games. They're not really defined by like one thing or like one specific element. They're defined more by the sum total of all those parts. And so now I think what you see is, in terms of design ethos, you have this idea of an indie role-playing game, which has with that comes with it a lot of different sort of design assumptions or, or presumptions about why you're designing the game. Or you might have an old-school game, which has a different set of you know aesthetic design choices around it. Mm -hmm. But what we saw across the board was that games were trending more and more toward simplicity unless you're looking at games that were sort of commercially produced, you know, by like, you know, companies that exist to print role-playing games and have staffs of people or aspire to. Like those games were very, still very much being built in the sort of uh, very heavy mechanics, very like, uh, you know, there was a lot of game there, you know, like like lots of rules and lots of rules that you're meant to, to follow and rules that, that sort of leaned on other rules. And, you know, it really, I felt kind of like, especially for D&D, the focus had gone from the play to like the rule set itself. That mm -hmm. you could be a great D&D player just by really learning the rules, speaking that language. And I thought it was really interesting that while you have the old school renaissance and indie games are very different stylistically, you know, very different approaches. They share a, a, a surprising common ground in that they both try to make games that are fairly accessible and very fast. And when I say fast, I mean in, in the sense of you can take someone who's never played a game, a role-playing game before, and get them up and playing fairly quickly. 
Mm -hmm. And I think that was a trend I just thought was really interesting. And that was something that we had to really look at because, I, again, I just think it's really interesting you could take a creative thing like role-playing game design and have two almost diametrically opposed approaches to design, but yet they have this common ground. And I think one of the other things we saw when we looked at sort of the historical record of D&D sales, it's like, it's like analyzing the fossil record, you know, like you go back and you dig deeper and deeper and like you find the bones of like, you know, 80, 80 second edition. And yeah. You know, what happened to it, right? And like look at the sales records, how did it die or whatever, right? Like, and what we really found was that while, you know, third and fourth edition had, had done well compared to each other, our suspicion was that they weren't doing as well as the game role playing games had done in the 90s or in the 80s not because you know just some magic factor back then more people wanted to role play we thought maybe it was just because D&D had just become too complicated that this this urge we saw on these opposite spectrums of this, of design that were trending towards faster play pick up and play games that are really concise, games that are really tightly focused, or games that if they were more traditional role-playing game design, it's meant to cover a lot of stuff, didn't have that many rules, really more of a framework for a game master to use. And so that really, you know, helped drive us, you know, and I think back now, I'm, it's funny, right? I'm in my 40s now. When I was in my 20s, I always thought it was funny, like my dad couldn't remember like, you know, the first time, you know, that maybe he, you know, like, drove a car or something like that. I can't remember the exact year. Yeah, mm -hmm. but now I'm in the phone. I can't remember exact years anymore. I guess I'm just too old. <laughs> so I, I might be off with some of the games. Like some of these games may be games that came out like a little bit earlier than I thought, or maybe even came out after we started working on 5e. But they all played a role. Um, and so those are definitely like the, the general tendency in old school games to like you know kind of strip down D and D. That was definitely something we looked at. Uh, Dungeon World, and you know a game that has oh, a very yeah. You know, in indie feel, but is very much like you know D and D like play. Um, and then looking around at uh, games like Fiasco and stuff, uh, you know, they may not have had a direct like, oh, let's make D and D like Fiasco, or like let's make D and D an indie game. But it's more this idea like let's make a D and D a game that people can just play. You know, they can just sit down and and you know, I want to play some D and D, so here's a pre made character we can just start playing. And a lot mm -hmm. of that. A lot of that was just emphasizing the idea that D and D is a social game, and it's a game that's even if it's not about storytelling in the sense of you know a D and D session might not be the action in the game might not be a great story if you just sit down and recount it. But if you were to think about it as a person, you think, oh, that was a fun time. That was that was a good. I had a good time. That was a really funny story, right? And in the story might be me and my friends did something funny, or you know someone told a good joke, or oh, I can't believe that like you know your your character turned out to be evil. You know, story is relative. You know, like what what you might think is boring, I might think is a really interesting story because it's all very personal. But that was really kind of the emphasis in D and D was to get back at that real social sense of play. Of uh, it's D and D is a game where you hang out with your friends and you have this shared imaginary world that one of you sort of created and you're going to mess around with it. And it's really about the action at the table rather than. You know, in a lot of ways, you don't need any rules to play D&D. The rules yeah. are just there because otherwise it'd be chaos, right? Like... The, um, <laughs> the thing that you, you touched on, and this was a, this was really interesting for me because coming from coming from 4th edition, which, by the way, I'm, I mean, I'm one of those few people who I really liked 4th edition for a lot of things, I think. And there was actually an yeah. article, I forget who wrote it, but um, uh, someone wrote an article recently. I think it was, um, it was, it was either Mike Shea uh, on Slay Flourish or it was, um, uh... Tom Lama was one of the two uh, about mm -hmm. using like the the lessons that fourth edition, especially with the powers and stuff like that, can te you know can uh, transfer very well to make more interesting fifth edition fights and uh, creatures and this and that. Because there was a lot there that I really liked. Um, I I kind of think fourth edition was most to me was at its best when it was being used as like a sort of like a like a dungeon crawling kind of resource management ty type game more than. You know, it, it did that a lot better than uh, it did some other things. Uh, uh, but the so I, I wasn't coming from fifth edition from a place of like, oh, I didn't like this last edition. I hope the next thing's better. But when I saw fifth edition, she's like, the first uh, during the the next play test, the first thing that came to mind is, oh, they are they are bar like this is this looks to me like half uh, legacy D and D like the stuff that kind of has to be there because it's legacy, you know, it's D&D &D, and the rest is like, ease is cribbed from like adventure world and, you know, or, you know, dungeon world and all the, or, uh, and all these, 
uh, these other things that are like lightweight systems that you know are basically saying like okay as a dm you don't need a rule for this you can just yeah you can just kind of do whatever you want with it you know it's it doesn't this yeah. doesn't need to be on paper for it to be part of the game yeah and that's i mean that's something which we we sort of learned because so fourth edition has a lot of interesting lessons in it. um and i think one of the biggest ones that i've learned the hard way because I, I did a lot of work in fourth edition and uh is that there is a huge difference between game design and game mm -hmm. information and I was thinking about this, you know, I actually just said this this last week, because, you know, I think I, in the preamble, sort of, you know, when I introduced myself, mm -hmm. I talked about that divide between where Jeremy Crawford and I, the different things we do, where Jeremy really is the rules implement, implementator, and I am more the rules creator. Mm -hmm. And I think what happened with 4th edition was the line between implementation and design uh, was, was, well, just wasn't there. A new so what follower. happened is you'd have this idea of maybe something that you want to have happen in D&D. Like the, the, one, of the idea, one of the guiding principles of 4th edition was make the classes balanced. Well, yeah. you can say that as a design thing, but implementing that is a very different thing. And I think we ended up, and I think that's a good example of something which, like, people coming from more of a role-playing game, you know, from, from, especially from 3rd edition, not from role-playing game, we're a 3D background. Mm -hmm. had issues with where, you know, they would say, oh, the classes just look, they look too much the same. You know, where it's something where that design principle makes sense, but the implementation of it just didn't really hit what people were looking for. I don't think it actually, because I think when you say, oh, I want the classes to be balanced, that has an important unspoken assumption that the classes yeah. are going to be different. Right? Yeah. If the classes, if there's only one character class, and it only has one set of choices, then you have balance, right? Everyone's playing the same thing, you know? Uh, maybe you have imbalance introduced through the course of play. Like you can imagine a game like Monopoly, is you know it's 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 pretty balanced, other than the fact that some people go before other people. Whoever goes first probably has some sort of advantage. I don't know. I don't play much Monopoly, but the uh, but that would be unsatisfying for a game like a role playing game like Dungeons and Dragons, where people want to feel very distinct. Uh, they don't want just the, the service distinctions. And I think that's one of the things that 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 fourth edition had issues with in terms of its acceptance was that there are these principles where if you'd state them, I think people would say, oh, that sounds good. I want that. I've been playing d and for a long time. I wouldn't have it happen that. But when they saw the actual implementation of it, they the implementation overshadowed the reason why it was being done. You know, the everyone gets powers at the same rate. Well, now the classes feel the same. Yeah, but they're balanced. But yeah, but we've lost the reason for balance, which was I want balance because I want things to be different. Yeah. If, if things aren't different, I don't need balance. I also think... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, but ask me. Oh no, no. I was um, I was gonna, I was gonna elaborate oh. on that because um, no, uh, sorry. Uh, people are telling me about the 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 audio. I'm trying to trying to balance it on my end. Oh. Just let me let me know when it is when it's good, guys. I'm I again. I, it's very different in my ear than it is on stream. Um, okay. So the um, so the one like I I maintain a uh, a long-standing Pathfinder group that I play with on Fridays, but all my other role-playing has primarily, uh, it was primarily D&D 5th edition, and it kind of, you know, since I moved over there. Um, the the thing, the reason that I still really enjoy the Pathfinder system is most, not necessarily because of the rules or the balance, but it's because of the character options. Like, I love yeah. being able to pick from a long list of really cool-sounding things for a character, even if now tons of those are mechanically inviolable or don't really make much sense because of the way they're not very well balanced but the the fa like being able to use those ideas to create a character to me is interesting do you think that uh fifth edition is sort of design like is, is the design principle to to kind of add like add that stuff over time or, or is it or are you more like a, a ranger is mechanically is a ranger is a ranger and then you just sort of paint it however you want yeah you know it's a it's a it's a much different path we're going uh we actually just this just came up last week we were doing mm -hmm. um we're doing some new game mechanics if you if you follow unearthed arcana it's right now it's a weekly series on our website that's so going to go back to being monthly soon uh we introduce all we introduce different character options new rules uh, for playtest right we let people look at them and comment and one of the guiding principles, it's a huge difference between, say, 3rd or 4th and 5th. It comes down to this. In 3rd edition, or in 4th edition, if you thought to yourself, I want to play a character who's an archer. I just mm -hmm. saw, you know, it's, it's 2001, I just saw that great new Lord of the Rings movie. I hope it, I hope it does well, because I want to see part 2, right? Whatever. <laughs> the, uh, and you're like, I want to play an archer. Well, if, if you were to open up that 3.0 player's handbook and say, where's the archer? There really isn't one. Like, it's in there, but you have to go find it. 
Yeah. You have to look and say, okay, I need to read the fighter and then the ranger, because those seem like guys who use bows. And then I need to go read the feats, and I need to I need to figure out that point blank shot is the first feat I kind of need to take, because then I can take precise shot, yeah. which is really important because uh, in third it's third edition at least, um, there was a cover bonus if you're firing into into you know if there are two guys fighting and you want to shoot one of them, yeah, there's some like oh, God, a, yeah. a minus two penalty, then you took the shooting cover into penalty. melee, it, oh, yeah, it's yeah, it was yeah, and so it would be so you would think to yourself, I just want to be an archer. Well, that actually required you to actually make an archer that could work, assuming the dungeon master was using all the rules you know, knew all those rules, was applying them. Uh, you had to really know the game, not super well, but you had to study it a bit. One of the really key principles of 5th edition is we really don't want to do that anymore. We mm-hmm. want you to, if you say, now the irony is I'm going to get to in a sec, but the, hey, I want to be an archer, you can just open up to the fighter and there's something called archer that you just mm-hmm. pick. And we have that in like in the weapon styles. Uh, at second level you get. Um, the fighter's actually a good uh, example of that because I'm actually not very happy with the fighter right now. Uh, I don't like that its subclasses are called uh, Champion and Battlemaster. Because I mm-hmm. think if I was to take, say, if you took someone who's like a casual Warcraft or Diablo player, and maybe they played they played Skyrim, they want to play D anD D, and they're saying, "Oh, I want to be like a warrior guy," and I said, "Oh, great, you want to be a champion or a Battlemaster?" I might as well be asking them if they want their character to be right or left handed. Like it makes no sense. Like yeah, the, the, how the, know, the words right? have no context to them. Exactly. Where if I said something like, "Do you want to be if they want to be a cleric?" I could say, "Well, do you want to be a cleric of war or a cleric of life?" And mm-hmm. you can, oh, okay, I get it. You know, if I just know fantasy and I know what a cleric is, I can get a pretty good sense of the difference between a cleric of life and a cleric of war. You know, uh, a wizard who's an illusionist versus a wizard who's a necromancer. And so that's one of the key things. So I think what you'll see is where one of the big tests we have when we do like a new character um, subclass mm-hmm. is whether it resonates with people. So uh, we not only look at the feedback in terms of whether people approve something, but what we generally see is a new for something follower. to reach the levels of approval that we're looking for, mm-hmm. uh, it requires it to at least be on some level resonant. Like it has to be a, a archetype, like a samurai, that people can go, okay, I can picture yeah. who that character in my head. You know, rather than, well, to build a samurai, what you need to do is, and then take all the series of feats or these, these abilities that are, that the names are more, you know, descriptive than actually explaining who might take this. Mm-hmm. And you know, and that's a perfectly fine way to design a game. But it, from my standpoint, and I think this is something that's kind of was very challenging in D and D's past. That's a lot more like how you design a collectible card game or any other competitive game like that, mm-hmm. where where part of the game is you want to kind of obfuscate, you know, the moving parts because part of the fun is discovering that. Yeah. You know, like, and when I started, I mean, I remember the when I got hooked on Magic was when I first discovered that I had a card. Uh, I forget what it's called, a Pestilence. You could spend mana to do damage to everything in the game. And it was a black card. And I there were other cards that there was a white card that had protection from black. And the first time I realized, hey, if I play Pestilence and bomb the board with all this damage, my little weenie guys for protection from black will survive it. And that was like that light bulb moment. It's not an awesome combo. Like, yeah. No one's going to win a, a tournament with that. But it was the point where I realized, oh, this is why magic's interesting. So I want to start playing magic. And I then bought booster boxes and all that other stuff. Yeah. But it was that moment of discovery. I don't think D&D really has ever needed that. It's a role-playing game. I think mm-hmm. that that moment comes more in play when something interesting happens or something random happens or the, there's a great plot twist or someone, you know, like, I just, I, I think adding that on to D&D at the, in the end of the day really limited its appeal a lot more than we, we suspected. Yeah, no, I, I, I follow you there. And first of all, like, I, I think everyone can probably identify with, like, that that sort of hobby moment where like you're right in, in magic you find this probably it's probably a, like a crappy combo you know but it's it's yours yeah. and you're like yeah, that, exactly. yes <laughs> no I can make this work I will win with this and then you never do but it's still it's still your thing um, I think actually a lot of that discovery um, like being able to discover things like that and being able to kind of create your own interesting um, amalgamation of different rules is possible like it's definitely why um for example the the pathfinder system still maintains some uh enjoy like the enjoyment for my friday group they really like yeah. the mechanical stuff like to them um you know to them being able to find a cool feat you know that works perfectly with their build is you know that's that's a part of their fun and that's you know obviously i i still play it because um there's you know there's there's content there but um yeah it does not like. Here's the thing I learned. Um, it, it does not play well on on like a stream and on a on a game where speed and kind of being verbose with the rules. Like I've been playing Pathfinder for 
six years now, and I still know, I still have to look up rules all the time. Like, I'm always going to the SRD and, you know, trying to find out how something works with something else. Um, whereas uh, in 5th edition, it tends to be a lot easier, which is, I think, largely why 5th um, edition has kind of resonated so much, especially with, uh, and I don't know if you've noticed it, but it, it's like, uh, it helped, I think, the, the the live streaming community and stuff just kind of explode. Yeah. No, I think that's something. Oh yeah, I definitely. I was watching. I, I just got into Hearthstone. I just started playing it, and I was watching. Yeah. Um, who was it? I think it was Trump. And he was. I'm watching his stream, and he's like, "Oh, okay, I have to take a break because we're playing D and D in two hours." And I was like, "Well, that's cool." <laughs> but but I think it's important too. Like when I'm talking about that, and what you're talking about with um, you know, with like Pathfinder or games like that. There's nothing. I, I think that that that's it's if you know people like that, and I myself have enjoyed that. But I think there's an important part of it that for Dungeons and Dragons, which is sort of the gateway that was kind of a dangerous path to go because I, the way I think of it is D and D it's for many people, it's their first step into tabletop role playing. Mm-hmm. So I think I that it's important that D and D, if anything, when we think about D and D, we think how can we make it even more accessible, you know, because, and I think without that good gateway that D and D provides, it's harder for games that are more specialized or that have more of a focus to them to find that audience because they're not entirely, but they're probably like 50%, you know, or so drawing on, people who play D&D and are now interested in other games, you mm-hmm. know, the, um, and so I think that's where that went, you know, it's, 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 it's nothing against that style of game design. I think it's like, you know, like I said, it's not, it, it I have, it's, there's nothing wrong with designing a game that way, but I think it's, it's difficult when Dungeons and Dragons is designed that way. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why we've seen this big groundswell of uh, popularity with fifth edition that at the end, I mean, so far, uh, it seems like we were, we were kind of right in thinking that there was nothing, magical at the 80s or 90s that made more people role play it was just that the games were more accessible back then um and now i think what you're getting is why you could say oh there's video games and you know that you, you, you could be playing an online game instead but with things like streaming you know uh they it's made dungeons and dragons so much more accessible now right like for, you yeah know, it, it's if you want to learn how to play D, just watch someone playing it and you, you've learned like 90 percent of what you need to know you know yeah it's um it i i think like we uh I don't know if you were the same as me. The, uh, I uh, grew up, like, after college, I kind of lost all my, all my friends moved away, um, and so I was kind of stranded here, um, and I wanted to play game, uh, role-playing games and stuff, and I, I grew up, like, while I was going to college, I was, like, in high school, was the early to mid-2000s, there was no such thing, aside from text, which I was never really good at, there was no way to play a role-playing game online, so it's if you didn't have a group, you just didn't have a group, there was nothing you could do about it, uh, and there was no such thing as, like, streaming D&D, I think there were maybe, like, a, f- a handful of podcasts that play, you know, that, that did it, but not enough to, to really talk about, and then, like, it was, I think it was, it was definitely Roll20 that kind of started this sort of renaissance of, of role-playing games, you know, being being brought to people that have never been able to do it before, that are, you know, people who are stranded with a no way to find follower. a group, and then, you know, and enabled D&D streaming to become as, as big as it is, because, you know, thank God for that, because I, I wouldn't have a, a show if I didn't, like, if I yeah. had to only play with the people, you know, at a table. Um, yeah. And I think I think D and D the the fifth edition is is really interesting in how sort of how it synergized with that kind of community because of the because of its sort of lightweight lightweight roots. Um, do you think like now this is something I've I've talked with uh, I've talked with Greg Tito a little bit about this. Uh, you guys they just released D and D Beyond and that was an interesting thing for me. Um, do you guys see like? Uh, I, I maybe maybe you can't talk about this. I don't know, but do you see wizards kind of or, or where you're coming from, uh, looking towards how people are using these games in you know uh, as entertainment rather than like uh, when you when you maybe add things or design your next kind of iteration. Oh yeah, definitely. You know, I think that's something which we we really have to be aware of. You know, and I think what drove a lot of a lot of the five E success too was. You know, we, we really focus on uh, playtesting, reaching out to the audience. And I think we, we would be foolish to not think about, you know, if we're going to revise the game, you know, taking into account streaming, you know, how people not only play the game, but interact with the game. Mm-hmm. You know, really think of D&D, and it's a hobby, right? It's something people do as, like, their main thing. There are people who dedicate entire rooms of their house to, like, you know, it's, it's the game room. It's their, their D&D room. And so we really try to think of D&D as something that is something you can do all the time 
you know, it's not just something that you're doing when, when you're around the table with your friends rolling dice, whether you're playing online, whether you're watching someone stream, whether you're reading about it online, uh, whether you're using an app, you know, to interact with the game. And, you know, I said, that's where I, I think, and, you know, like I said before, a lot of ways, you know, our thinking right now is like, you know, how can we make the game even easier to play? How can we speed things up without losing some of that, that fun texture, you know, that mm-hmm. makes characters. You know, that's kind of essentially what you're doing, right? When, you, when you're designing a game, you have your, your budget of complexity and you have to spend it on the important stuff. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to waste mm-hmm. it on things that aren't actually making the game more interesting or more fun. Uh, and, and fun and all that stuff, these are all, I mean, fun's kind of an empty term because, you, you know, fun on its own is meaningless. You know, when you're designing a game, you're basically de- you're basically defining what fun is for that game and then just trying to build rules to encourage that fun behavior. Yeah, um, it's, again, it's, it's, it's really interesting because uh, if, I, I'm sure the people at Wizards would, you know, are, are doubly kind of, uh, you know, feel doubly this way, but, like, if you had told me a couple, maybe a new two follower. or three years ago that, uh, like, one of the biggest forms of live entertainment, like, most biggest and growing forms of live entertainment was going to be people sitting around a table wa- playing D&D and having, you know, thousands and thousands of people watching them, I would have been, you know, I would have been as skeptical as anyone else throughout yeah. history would have been if you told them that. But, you know, now now we're seeing, you know, we're seeing this this strange age where, like, there's there's money being put towards role-playing games, like production and and stage shows and all this stuff. Um, and it's it's so interesting because, um, to me, it's, it's interesting from a sense of, like, what is that going to do to the hobby itself? Uh, how, how, like... Are we going to see games designed with that in mind, like, and and how, you know? Yeah, you know, it's interesting to think because I, I mean, right now, the um, you know, it's very, I mean, role playing games are very tabletop driven for tabletop role playing games. The um, I think in a lot of ways, it's just you know keeping the game, you know. I, I think the one thing that, that that streaming requires, and I see this all the time, is you know people really don't want to watch people arguing over the rules, and you, they really don't want to watch people enforcing the rules, right? If you're having to stop the action constantly to, rem- to remind people of a rule mm-hmm. or to apply things, people yep. don't like want to watch people do math, you know, things like that. <laughs> so, but but I think in a lot of ways, it's all the things that make the game more accessible in general are really playing well there. You know, the now I don't, I don't know on the technology end what what we, what we might see. I mean, that's something where I think as we get more tools and things like that to automate play. Um, you know, and that's where I think D and D Beyond I'm looking forward to. I already I have my beta account. I've been using it. Yeah, so, so do I. And I'm looking for, I can't wait for them to roll out some more stuff. But, um, but you know, I think at the end of the day, too, though, it, it really is about the human drama. You know, I think that's why people watch, because they find it, it's either it's funny. I mean, that's where I, I got into the two, right? When I started, when I first heard of Odd Twitch and people streaming, I had to, I had to put on my, like, my old man that's, hat. Like, why would what? you watch people playing a game? <laughs> watch a game in my day. We played games. <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. But the... Uh, but then I got into, uh, I was playing Destiny, and you know, I got into it, and I was like, man, I am really bad at Destiny PvP. I was horrible. It was awful. I was the guy, like, I'd walk backwards off a cliff, like, and that was a good move on my part. The, uh, but I started, so while these people are playing, I can watch, like, people who are good and maybe learn. And then what I found was, while, you know, it's useful to watch someone who's good at PvP playing, it was just the best streamers were the, the funny ones, right? Mm-hmm. The one, And it was hilarious watching some of these guys you know, there's one streamer, I forget who it was, but uh, he was, a, he was uh, I think, I imagine he's still around, I, I, uh, a Destiny streamer. I went back and watched his first episode, and it was hilarious how bad it was. But it was incredible to see how he went from his first episode being like, most of it's silence, he's just running around, Casey makes a really lame joke, and then 30 episodes later, he's funny, and he's hilarious, and he's like, you know, it, it's just, he's got, you know, and it was just, you could see that evolution where people kind of realize the, you know, watching a funny person play a video game is really fun, right? And especially, you know, when, when they involve the audience and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, and so I think that's something that's just going to keep evolving for games in general. You know, because games, mm-hmm. games, I think, are really meant to be, in the end of the day, you know, I have all these questions in my head, like, why do we play games, right? Why do humans play games? You know, like, why do my dogs play games? My dogs like to play fetch. It's a game. They like playing it. You know, and I think that there's a lot of answers, you know, and I'm sure someone who's a sociologist or like much smarter than me <laughs> has like a much better answer. But but I think there's something that's very much about, you know, like uh, there's a big thing about games are a very good way to meet people. They're a very good way to socialize. Because yeah. essentially, you know, if the first time I met you, you can imagine if this is an ancient Mesopotamia or something like that. 
And the first time I met you is when we're haggling over the cost of beets, right? Yeah. That's a very antagonistic relationship, right? Yeah, like, oh, you, you're, you in, you're your inherently, yeah. your relationship is, is inherently aggressive. Yeah, right? Like, I don't want to, like, spend too much for beets, but you don't want to sell them for too little, so we're going to go back and forth. But if the first time we meet is if we're playing a game, you know, uh, and I know they had games back then. I think it was Kemet, I think was one of the games from ancient, maybe from ancient Egypt or Babylonia, I forget which. You know, we can play the game, and I, we can play the game, and I can lose, but then we just play again. I haven't lost anything other than my time. And if I like the game, you know, and I've experienced this with like, competitive games all the time. I'm doing this now with Hearthstone. Mm-hmm. My favorite Hearthstone are the ones, where, or Magic, very much the same way, too. I lose, but I learn something. You know, I realize, oh, here's something I need to look out for. Yeah. You know, it's it's like a safe way to, it's a safe way to compete. You know, there's a reason why, when I used to really watch a lot of pro wrestling, you, you know, you could tell... When, when, if a wrestler was a actually genuinely follower. hurt, maybe they fell off the turnbuckle or, you know, something didn't quite go right. The audience's mood changed. You know, mm-hmm. people went from like, cheering, you know, the, the, uh, the heels and cheering for the baby faces to just like everyone was, oh, now everyone's wearing the skin. Someone actually got hurt. I mean, you just watch these guys jump off the top turnbuckle, slam into each other's head, throw each, you know, smash each other over the head with a, with a steel chair, and you're cheering, but as soon as someone, like, looks like they actually twisted their ankle, now everyone's like, ooh, I hope he's okay, right? Like, it, and I think it's a similar thing. It's, it puts us in a situation that might otherwise be dangerous or costly and lets us relax and learn from it and then and use that to socialize in this sort of risk-free environment. Yeah, um, the, uh, actually, the, there was, um, there was something I, I, I sent out a, se- a series of tweets, but what you're saying about, what you're saying just sort of reminded me about that, um, when you, you were talking about, like, what happens when someone that you're watching or s- makes a mistake, and D&D is very similar, whether it be a streamer a that you're follower. watching or just your DM that you're sitting at a table is, and th- th- what I tweeted out was, you know, was something about, to the effect of, like, as a DM, we're all going to make mistakes. We're going to make lots of mistakes. We're going to we make mistakes all the time. Um, but and and the, uh, it was it was in response. I think it was uh, someone had someone had asked why people who haven't DM'd yet, you know, haven't been a dungeon master. Like what's stopping them? Um, and a lot of the answers, oh, you know, I don't know the rules. Well, you know, I don't. What if I mess up? You know, whatever. And it's like no one that's sitting down to play with you at a table is rooting for you to fail. Like no yeah, one exactly. is there. No yeah. one is there to hold it over you when you forget a rule or you mess up. Like yeah. everyone, unless they're horrible, horrible people, everyone is sitting yeah, there exactly, to have right? a good time. They would have you have to be a total dick, like the kind of person you just shouldn't play games with. Yeah, to do that. And no one likes the guy who takes the game too seriously. No one likes that person. <laughs> and and it's also like um. But it, but it is, you know, it is a, it is kind of one of those fear factors for people. Is you know, they, it feels like public speaking, but it's like, but no one, like, I, I don't think anyone's ever held it against me when I flubbed a rule, you know, or yeah. when a speech that I had, to, an NBC had to give, wasn't quite as, or or you cough in the middle of a monologue or something like that. Like, yeah. no one, no one's gonna, no one's gonna, you know, gonna yell at you or like walk out on you for that because. That's not why we're. That's not why we kind of get together. That's not why we sit down at a table. Um, oh yeah, and just you know, it was kind of it was kind of interesting the way you know, uh, the what you were what you were talking about just just sort of reminded me a little bit about that. Um, and it's you know, it, it's it's so interesting. Um, you know, it, I I love talking about dungeon master stuff, and mostly because um, I like I love dispelling the ideas about gaming in general like the things that no one told us when we were kids you know when we were starting out and you know now well okay now maybe we can tell (laughs) tell these things to someone else who hasn't heard them before um by the way i missed it before and i wanted to thank uh judo killer for the ten dollar donation thank you so much man says keep up the streams they're enjoyed and appreciated I know you are enjoyed and appreciated, Judo Killer. Thank you so much, my friend. Um, if you guys see below, uh, I'm gonna go check the link right now. But we're uh, let's get get some retweets going, and we will uh, we we might have a giveaway coming up in just a bit. Uh, I think we're we kind of started late, and I don't want to spend too much time just talking our stuff. I know we have a lot of people in chat who probably have a lot of questions. So why don't we go ahead and open up the floor to questions and topics? Uh, we have obviously Mike Merle's the man himself here uh, to answer anything you want to know about D and D, or just really personal stuff too. I guess uh, not too personal. <laughs> 
That would um, be boring, right? Like, you're just some... follower. <laughs> What's yeah. the most interesting you've ever done? I, uh... I, I say that a lot. I say, you know, just as weirdly personal as you want to get. And people, ne- people never get that weird. Um, so here's the deal, guys. If you want to ask a question, just either tag me at Exploding Dice or write question in, uh, in big letters or something so I, I can see it in the chat. Uh, and we will take them as they come. If we don't get, we'll try and answer them as in depth as we can, but also quickly so we can get a couple others. As we're doing that, if you haven't already, please hit that retweet link. Dice Lou's got it for you, and also the giveaway link. Make sure you get in on that. Uh, that's our Yawning Portal monthly giveaway, and that is uh, that's that's just right there in chat. Um, so let's start off. Shadzar, my good friend, says, uh, "Hi, Mike. Last question." Uh, or last asked you this question before fourth came out, and now want to ask it again. How much of the game uh, is played in the actual game session, and how much is played at character creation? And do you feel that you're kind of reaching a balance between those two? Yeah, I think that's that's a that's a that's a really it's something which we've con- constantly tried to to, to shift. Mm-hmm. The uh, I would say that with fifth, I, I think a lot less of your time is now spent in, in character creation and away from the table. Uh, by the peg it, you know, I'd say maybe like 10% of your time now. I, I think it's much less. You know, you don't really have the same combos, mm-hmm. especially be. I, I think what your your tactics in fifth are much more likely to be um, how to sequence things rather than necessarily how to drop them on top of each other, where, uh, especially with the concentration mechanic, mm-hmm. uh, which really limits the number of buffs you can drop on characters, you're more thinking, if this fails, then what's next? Or once we do this, what are we doing next? And so I think that by its nature is a bit more limited in terms of your, your, your how much your prep really pays off. Uh, I think for Dungeon Masters, um, the one thing I'm not completely happy with in fifth is a thing for Dungeon Masters. It's a little bit, it's not a little bit, it is. It's harder to predict the, the lethal uh, combat encounters. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, sometimes. You have to put a little more, yeah, and you have to put a little more work into like designing the encounter areas. So I think for Dungeon Masters, that prep time may have gone up a bit. Uh, where I think maybe um, follower. benchmarking against my own prep time I would say if in fourth edition, a four-hour session, I'd probably spend an hour prepping for. Where now in fifth, I'm probably spending maybe 90 minutes prepping. Um, I think it does take a little bit longer. Uh, also because you you'd now, to be fair, uh, <laughs> fair to fair to fifth, who's my baby? I don't want to, but whatever. The, uh, you maybe do get through a little bit more. But I also think that the idea, oh, you get through more content in fifth versus fourth, it's a little bit... I don't want to say it's disingenuous, but I think that you're you're getting four hours of fun either way, right? It's not like you yeah. might get through more encounters in fifth, but in fourth, your your individual encounters are more protein rich. I guess I'd say it's like it's more there's more there. Uh, they take a bit longer, but you're using more stuff. Um, so I think that's kind of a wash. So yeah, so I, I would say probably follower. for me DMing wise, I'm probably spending like I'll do some rough math in my head, like thirty to forty percent of my time prep and the rest play. And for players, it might be down to like ten to twenty percent. If actually it's ten percent, I wouldn't be surprised. I'd probably go a follower. So, so I, I think that's gotten a lot lower for players. Mm-hmm. Now, be curious. I don't know if I have. I don't recall the answer I would have given back in the day. So, if you have that handy, that'd be interesting to see. It'd be, it's like the same answer, right? That'd be yeah. hilarious. Like, no, the same. You gave the same answer like five years. <laughs> yeah. You know, way to I'm, go. Way to evolve as a game designer. You're giving the same. <laughs> just, just as a quick addendum, because this is that actually. Um, yeah, I will load lower the notification volume. Sorry, guys. Uh, if you, this is a quick addendum, um, because it, I was thinking of it as you were talking, uh, do you think, th- when, as, like, as a rules designer, as one of the kind of, you know, the guys who helps kind of design the game as a whole, do you get very mechanical when you do your prep, or ha- no. do, are you as lazy <laughs> as I am? That is probably one of the funniest things, is, uh, I am not... A new well, thing. here's my, my secret, is I reskin stuff like mad. Yeah. You know, like, I just turn a session... Uh, I ran a session a couple weeks ago, and I wanted to have this like big evil guy in the end, like this kind of warrior guy. So I just opened up my monster manual, and I saw, hey, Chimera. Okay, uh, how can I use a Chimera as like to mean like a guy rather than this monster? I'm like, okay, great. The guy is wearing a helmet with ram's head horns on it, and he's got a shield that's got a dragon face on it. So he uses his shield to, breed, to blast people with fire, and he headbutts with his helmet, and then he swings his sword. And uh, Chimera has wings, so I guess he's got magic boots that let him fly, right? <laughs> like that was. But the thing was, the players had no idea. You know, yeah. Oh I, no, actually, no, obviously. Scenario, you know, and that's what's fun about it, and it's great. Like the first time you describe, like you know, it, it's this adventure I've run a few times. I've run it in conventions. I ran it in my home. That's why I ran it originally for my home campaign. Then I've run mm-hmm. it a few times at cons. Um, 
and it's great. The first time they see this guy animate, and I describe, oh, and it actually worked really well because I could describe, oh, you see his helmets gleaming, it's got these horns, and there's like energy around it. Like, oh, this guy has like all this stuff. This is gonna be nasty, right? Like half this guy, guy's gear is magical. You know, and the first time I describe, you see flames play on the surface of the shield. Oh no, right? And it actually worked out really well. And uh, so, yeah, I am definitely much more. I, I think the last time I designed a custom monster was. Whew, and my current campaign was actually the first adventurer. No, no, because I used cockatrice for that. I had these statues that would turn mm-hmm. you to stone, and I just used the cockatrice stats <laughs> for that. Do, do you actually, so, like, do you use straight-up stat blocks? Or, like, because yeah. one of the things I do a lot is I'll put a, a token on the field, and it's like, what is this monster? Like, I'm not, this, you know, the monster probably is, isn't one that has a stat block in the 5th edition monster manual or something, right? And I'll be like, mm-hmm. uh, this thing looks like it has a pretty good strength score, D twenty plus three, you know, like yeah, uh, no, yeah. like that's that's generally what I do a lot. Is you know, <laughs> I don't even have a stat block. I just like, what do I think this thing rolls? Uh, plus seven. Yeah, that, that sounds good. No, I, I will do that. Uh, if I such have to improvise something, but no, I, I'll use stat blocks straight out of the monster. I'll just completely reskin them. And uh, the okay. last creature, I actually, I think my players hated before. I did design a creature. It was a uh, this frost salamander, and uh, oh, it was so fun. Uh, I had fun DMing it. Um, it's it's sort of trick was it's a frost creature. So you go a frost creature. Let's hit it with fire. It had this crazy powerful breath weapon, and the the danger of it was if you hit it with fire, it reactivated the breath weapon. Mm-hmm. So the players, it you know, it opens with this breath. That's weapon a, that's a just, really it, fourth edition style move. Ex- yeah, exactly right. And it you know, and it was fun because you know it and it was definitely drawn from that playbook. I want to make the fight dynamic. And it also, where as a DM, I had fun with it. I described, okay, here's this creature. It's thrashing around. You hit it with fire, and as it burns through, the creature screams in agony. You see its spines on its back start to glow with like white light. Like, oh no! Like, and you know, what, what does that mean? The player, oh, it's gonna breathe again. Crap! We need to. What, yeah. How can we kill this thing quickly enough with fire so it doesn't breathe again? Because if it breathes again, it's gonna kill us. That that reminds me of a really long time ago. And I'm not gonna say which module this is in. This is in because it might it might give some spoilers. Uh, but there was um there was an adventure that was running back in fourth edition. Uh, and it was not as deadly as I wanted it to be. Uh, and so there was a fight with an with an ooze in it. Um. And I decided, okay, I, it might have been one, it might have been three, I don't remember. Uh, so I ran this fight, and my players came out of it perfectly fine. And I'm like, what can I, what can I do to make this ho- like to make this tougher? Do I hit them with for more damage? No, that's you know, that's just gonna end it earlier. Like more damage isn't necessarily more dangerous. Uh, well, yeah. it is, but it's not more interesting. Um, and yeah. so I was like, okay, so what happens if at half health the oozes start bubbling and they pop into the- minion oozes right yeah and so as soon as the first one pops and these minion oozes still can hit hard they just go down in one hit but as soon as one of them pops and the room starts now you have uh imagine you have three big oozes walking around a fairly small room right and then Mm -hmm. one of them pops into tiny smaller ones and the player's like okay that's a thing now we now like the other on the other side of the room they're fighting another who's like wait don't hit it it's gonna turn (laughs) into more (laughs) <laughs> and all of a sudden, the tension in the fight just skyrocketed because the players are like, "Do we do we pop this one? Do we deal with the little ones first? Do we let it hit us?" As you know, and that's why I lo- like I love just taking a, a, a monster and just adding just one detail like that that just yeah. kind of cranks it up, uh, you know, to the point where the players have no idea what to do. Cool. Um. Uh. Do 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 do. Oh, Raz six five one says. Uh, <laughs> Well, I, I don't know if this is this is Mike's domain, but yes, if we can expect an underwater campaign in the Forgotten Realms, um, not anytime soon. You know, actually, I, I'm a sucker for it. I, I love uh, Adventures at Sea, um, but we just we haven't. Um, let's see, we have about the next three or four years of storylines worked out. Mm-hmm. So I don't see it on the horizon, but it, but it's something which I have always been interested in. And actually, ironically, my current campaign, the players are like in sunken Atlantis. So I actually, I'm yeah. running in at least part of my campaign is undersea. So I've always liked that. It's, it hasn't really, just hasn't aligned yet with, with, with the stories we've done. So, but I would like to do one, but just not, not in the near future. Yeah, I've never done an underwater campaign. That sounds really interesting. I'm actually prepping a pirate campaign right now, though. Oh, cool. um, the, the, the fun thing about, about being underwater is you have all three dimensions to work with. And that's the first yeah. thing you have to teach the players is to think to look up. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's... They get used to yeah, underwater underwater encounters are always a, like uh, they've always been a challenge for me because it's like at some point I just sort of I just sort of stop paying attention to the the z axis 
because it yeah. kind of it kind of gets too hard to navigate, <laughs> especially when you only have like a two D map. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um. Uh. Do, 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 do. Paladin Hulk says, uh, "Who is the best dungeon master you know, and what makes them so great?" Spreads. Best dungeon master I know. There's I, I know a lot of really good dungeon masters. <laughs> But you know what? I'm gonna uh, actually. It's uh, it's someone who DM'd for me. I could say Chris Perkins, but that, that's a cheap answer because everyone gets to see him DM. Uh, <laughs> m- many years ago, uh, back in 3.0, I played in a campaign. Uh, my friend Eric ran, and I he, I thought he was a great dungeon master because Eric had a real talent for taking mundane things and making them really fun. So, for instance, we were um, we were exploring the Underdark and we fought some troglodytes and we were in bad shape. And we found a cache of potions. And in, in every other campaign, it's, oh, it's some vials of, with potions, right? Yeah. But in Eric's campaign, they're like, oh, no, no, these troglodytes, they've harvested human bladders. And that's what they use to store their potions. And to eat, <laughs> to drink the potion, you have to Makes eat. Makes sense. This, this, yeah, exactly. This human organ that has been preserved. You have to a eat it to get the, like, ah, uh, right? And that was fantastic, right? Like, it turns just, you know, something very mundane into, like, this real, like, now, luckily, I was playing a dwarf. So I said, well, it's not cannibalism if I do it, because, you know, <laughs> if I eat a human, that's not, that's cannibalism when you eat your own people. So it's totally good for, you know, for my character, Bjorn Battlehammer, to go ahead and do this. But it was just this, but the fact that I remember finding these potions is one of the high points of the campaign. And that says a lot about, you know, the skills of storyteller and that to really bring something that otherwise would have just been, okay, just take it out and move on and make it a really fun part where as a group, we really went back and forth on it. It was, it was, it was we had a lot of fun with it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that, again, I, that, that sounds really like really funny. I, that's, oh man. Um, I love, I love messing with like messing with de- like DMs who can kind of think in that level of detail. I'm not always great at it, but I, you know, when mm-hmm. it, when a DM's like, oh yeah, but then, then, then this, th- like I can just tweak, you know, this detail to make it more, you know, fit the story more. And it's, I like, again, yeah, it creates such a weird dilemma where there should not be a dilemma. Yeah. Um, uh, da, 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 da. uh, Ishman says, Mike, uh, do you feel that the, uh, do you feel that the, uh, Beastmaster Ranger, uh, wasn't really under, was a failure or not really understood what it was meant to be? I'm n- I'm trying to think of the context. I know you released an Unearthed Arcana for the, yeah, uh, yes, we, the Beastmaster. Yeah. So we, we did a new version. Uh, playtest feedback on it was overwhelmingly positive. So there's still things to tweak, but I think it's looking pretty good for us mm-hmm. to maybe push forward with that and maybe a future product. We'll see. But, you know, I think what happened is uh, we're looking back at the Ranger was I think we learned a pretty important lesson. And that's uh, when you're designing something, uh, you can't compare it to itself. And by that, I mean, with a Beastmaster, I'll use it as an example. You design the Beastmaster and you look at your first draft and you play test that and then you revise it and you play test that. What happens is, is rather than looking at the game as a whole, you just start looking at that one piece. And you start thinking of it just as an abstract piece. You don't mm-hmm. start thinking of it as, well, this thing has to stand up to comparison to everything else. So as a starting point, looking back, what we should have done was rather than play test the Beastmaster Ranger and then compare it to the Beastmaster Ranger, we should have play tested the Beastmaster Ranger, then compared it to the Hunter Ranger mm-hmm. and said, where are we, how is this holding up? We should have compared it to like a wizard or to the cleric, you know, or to, you know, to the classes. And so I think we ended up in a place where it felt really neutered because taken on its own, it was very easy to end up with something that felt too good. Um, it's, and especially if you're using miniatures and you're more tactical, which I think is more the bent of game designers is how they think of role-playing games. Um, but I, so I think that's something where we... we and and I, th- I think it's telling that, that that's the, the subclass that, that came out with the lowest ratings was one that had was very tactically... You know, if you had a large creature as your companion, it was very easy to just, well, you know, it's not doing anything, but just by having it sit in front of the door in this dungeon, it's blocking the doorway, you know, things like that. You know, not really thinking in terms of, well, but is this enjoyable? You know, again, it's that difference between design and implementation. Mm -hmm. The design was, I want to give you a cool pet that fights alongside you. The implementation became, how do I give you a extra party member? And not break action economy. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like that that's that that's important, but you can't trash the design yeah. in the process of the implementation. You yeah. Know? And and you know, and I think our, our our power ceiling was much higher than we thought it was in terms of what would be permissible because we kept comparing it to itself rather than mm-hmm. comparing it to the other ranger option. 
So. Yeah, some some people in chat were um, they I, I misread the quote. They were specifically asking about the player's handbook, Ranger, and I guess you talked yeah. specifically about that. Is uh, because the the criticism seems to be it's like, and that I trust me, I understand that because like especially when you're when you come from uh, you know I I used to have people asking for pets and stuff like that, and I'm thinking like. Every my my philosophy from back in Pathfinder when I had a player playing like a summoner who would like summon a ton of animals onto the field and it's like every everything that you add to the combat adds like f- ten minutes to the overall yeah. combat <laughs> and so that was why I'm always like I hey, don't want to add more models you know more things to the to the action you know the thing to manage yeah. but you know because it come and also it's it's just hard like more things in the player's control is harder to balance fights against yeah. Um, let me see here. Uh, real quick, Green Paradox says, uh, any intention to revisit uh, other TSR IPs, uh, Gamma World, Star Frontiers, all that, all that old stuff. Oh, I would love to. I would, especially Gamma World. I think Gamma World's very interesting. I, yeah, man, I haven't played uh, Gamma World in forever. <laughs> the uh, we don't have any plans right now. Uh, we got a plates full of D and D. The um, but it's definitely something I think would be really fun to do. I have like some, my own little house rules of Game World I put together, mm-hmm. uh, but I haven't played, I haven't played, play tested them yet. So maybe we'll use them like maybe we'll see them in the UA or something like that. But there's there's definitely interest on my part there. Like this is the thing I'm so I want to do everything, and that's actually kind of my problem is just <laughs> learning the you know sequence things and yeah and, and, and workload. Hey, you know I'm actually asking just for one second if you can put up. I have a dog here who has to really go outside for people. Yeah. Who, watching i'm actually i was out sick today from work so i'm actually at home so let me just take one sec to let this little dog outside absolutely yeah it's not a big deal uh so i'm gonna i'm gonna get i'm gonna call or harvest some of these other questions put them in a in a uh in a notepad document for myself but uh if you guys are just joining us by the way thank you for coming to hang out you are watching fuzzy dice the dungeon master show here on the exploding dice channel my name is uh, Astrid, and I'm your host and Dungeon Master. I'm hanging out here with Mr. Mike Merles, who is letting his dog out, which, you know, it's all good. Um, and we are taking your live questions uh, from chat to topics, all that good stuff to discuss. Yeah, you can't let implement implementation get in the way of design. That's, that is an interesting point. Um uh, Sorry, guys. I'm, I'm just... Uh, I'm, reading chat right now but if you guys have not already i gotta go check the retweet number make sure you hit that retweet link when we hit a big old goal on that we are going to be running a giveaway so i think we're at 18 right now uh so when we hit uh if we manage to hit 40 retweets i think that's the that's the goal i set for the night uh, if we manage to hit that i will be giving away a book you know what i can't decide i might be giving away a volo's guide to monsters I might be giving away a Dungeon Master's Guide. I don't know. We'll see. Whatever whatever happens. Wild things could happen. Um, all right. So I got a... All right. I'm, I'm back. Good? Cool, cool. And, well, the one thing I'll warn you is soon I'll have a small dog barking to be let back in. So, but that, that'll be quick. <laughs> That's just, all right. Just... Um, all right. So I got, a, I got a couple questions that people have been sending me here. Um, Quintus... J... Uh... Oh, no, that that wasn't a question. Uh, just uh, someone sent me a, a message that just said, basically was asking if uh, you guys were going to do non-Forgotten Realms content because uh, I, Forgotten Realms is, is weird. I think before, but I didn't know much about it before 5th edition, yeah. and now I feel like I'm an expert on it. <laughs> <laughs> cool, good. Because, <laughs> you know, because nope. I've read every, every adventure in it. But um, do you guys, I mean... I hey man, if there's a I, if there's a Dark Sun publication, I kind of yeah. I kind of might go in <laughs> on that. So I think for us, a lot of a lot of what worked well, when we relaunched, you know, uh, the Realms of Fifth, mm-hmm. uh, we went that with, with a new setting. So the um, I want to do again. This is my problem. I want to do everything right, <laughs> but um, I think it's important for us to look at. And this is the question: and If you want, if you ever want to like sit and say speculate, okay, so what the heck are they are they, are they going to do next? You could do worse than, than ask yourself. What could they do that will bring the most new people to Dungeons and Dragons? That's almost always our the question. That's not almost always. That is always the question we ask. Mm-hmm. So when we look at settings, it's not only just how can we make the setting interesting and distinct for existing gamers, but how can we frame it in a way or present it in a way, whether it's through the product or the game design, uh, that takes someone who maybe hasn't started playing D and D yet and makes them think, "Ooh, I want to start playing D and D." You know, and I think that could be you tell a new story. That could be tell you present a role playing game maybe in a different format, 
Um, that could be maybe you approach the rules a bit differently. Uh, maybe, you know, how you buy it. So, I don't know. Like, this is all speculative, right? But but generally, yeah, that's when we look at the settings, for us, the real benefit there is if we're going to do a new one, it's because we see an opportunity to bring more players to D&D. We don't want to just sell a new setting to existing players. I mean, that's great. And I'm not going to say don't buy it. If you play D&D, I'm like, hey, please buy it. That'd be great. But but at the end of the day, we want to see that what, everything we're doing is bringing in more and more new players. And, and I think that, that's, that's been a real fundamental shift in our strategy with, with Fifth Ed compared to the past. And we've always wanted new players, but I think it's been a much bigger focus now than it has been before. Yeah, that's, um, that's actually, uh, that was one of the, the uh, subjects that someone just came in and someone just um, put in chat. The, and I, I wanted to touch on this because we have, a, we have, a, we have a, lot of, a lot of interesting questions about, um, about setting stuff. Uh, but you you had touched on this, and someone because uh, Notorious Cashew said uh, I'm new and I'm going to be playing with a few friends soon. Uh, you know, uh, how kind of where do we where do we he's how do we learn where do we enter this game? Um, and is your I guess is is the idea of D and D that when you learn to play D and D you learn you know you kind of learn Forgotten Realms or yeah a good way to look at it yeah no it's basically the idea is as you play. As you play the adventures we published, that's kind of your exposure to the setting. Uh, and if you're a new player, I mean, the, the, your best bet, we have the d d basic rules are free online. So if you mm-hmm. want to get basic rules in one place, I wouldn't suggest downloading it and reading it straight through. If you like doing that, go ahead and do it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and I know there are people, I met someone at GDC who did it. She had just said she wanted to play D&D, so she went out, bought the player's handbook, and read it cover to cover. And she that's probably what I told people better. when I was 13. I was like, you want to <laughs> yeah. learn to play? Here's the rule book. You read it like yeah. I did. <laughs> <laughs> but the um if, if you want to start playing i think that the, the best place to start uh is there's a starter set we released it's uh it retails i think full price is 20 you can usually get it online for like 12 mm-hmm. to 15 and it has a the adventure goes to, to fifth level so that's about 20 to 30 hours of play so it's a lot of play in there and um really to learn how to play is just as watch streams that that's a good way to start you know to get a sense of how the game works and you know how the action flows and then just dive in you know like we were talking about earlier if you're dming for the first time everyone at the table one is rooting for you and yeah. uh don't worry about making mistakes just worry about having fun you know and if your players are laughing and having a good time then then you've won like that that you're doing it right yeah, it's um. By the way, if someone in chat, uh, I can't really do it myself. But if uh, if one of my mods or something wants to drop the um the link to the wizards page with the D and D basic rules, uh, that is that is, again, like you said, that's free online. So if you haven't already checked that out, you definitely should. Um. Uh. Yeah. It's it's you know I think it's easier than ever to get involved in. Like if you have a, a favorite internet or nerd celebrity, chances are they're probably playing D and D on the internet somewhere. So just go look for it. And then, you know, you can, you can spend your time with, with your favorite people, like the, the people that really entertain you and you can learn how to play. And there's a million and a half streams. I don't want to, I, I mean, you're, you're on a D and D stream right now. So like we have live play all the time. We have three campaigns going on a week. So always, you know, and, Everyone on everyone who plays, uh, especially podcasts and publicly, is more than happy to explain what's going on and you know help get you involved. No one's no one's gonna be like horrible about it. Um. Uh. So one another question says, uh, I don't I the the acronym I'm not I'm not sure about. He says, uh, any hopes now that Yawning Portal has uh, has come out for the full GDQ series? Or other kind of classics being being brought up, or was this like a kind of like a one-time thing? No, actually, we just announced um, earlier this month. Oh no, we're in April, so last month. Uh, Goodman Games. Uh, they are publishing uh, hardcover collections of two classic adventures, uh, Keep on the Borderlands and In oh. Search of the Unknown. And we hope that that's something which uh, we can make into a series with them. So that's something I'd love to see the, them tackle uh, the I entire. GDQ series. Now, obviously, we have uh, the the G series is is in uh, is in the book in, in, in Yawning Portal, but um, that wouldn't necessarily stop because one of the great things that uh, Goodman Games does is, uh, especially if you like, you know, if you're into the um, the history of the game, they collect a lot of information that surrounds the adventures. So they have commentary from the original designers, uh, essays by people like the original editors, playtesters, people who played the game, the adventure when it first came out. So, yeah, so that I'm hoping, uh, well, we'll see. I mean, we'll see how the first two do, and if there's demand, uh, I could definitely see them wanting to do uh, D- 
the entire uh, uh, Against the Giants series and beyond. Yeah, I uh, what was it? Uh, um, I can't remember. The, it was the S series, right, with the the Drow. That was the uh, uh, no D S. Series. Yeah, I was gonna say no. S was Tomb of Horrors. I think. Yeah, that's Tomb of Horrors. Yeah. Yeah, it was like um, stood for like special or something like that. Yeah, I don't, I, I never knew what those meant. The the letters, <laughs> I was, I was too young to know, to know. Uh, but no, the the Drow series, I, I haven't read it in a while, but I remember it being really, really good. Yeah, and it, it really kind of gets into that sort of. It's very open ended. You know, you, you yeah. look at it today, and it it assumes that you, it really assumes that you've been DMing for a while and you know what you're doing and you don't mind improvising. But that's actually, I mean, for me, that that's I enjoy that style. And I'll probably say I'm probably not very good at writing adventures because of that. You know, for me, my adventures are like one piece of paper with notes on them. Yeah. Writing them up for other people to run, it's not something which... Because for me, it's always the alchemy of like what happened in the moment, you know, or like yeah. that sudden like, oh, like, you know, I have here a note that the ogre is just a mercenary working for this guy. So will the players intimidate him or something like that? Like, okay, I'll just decide here's what he says or here's what mm -hmm. he wants to do or I'll let someone make a check or, or just, you know, try to talk the guy down or, you know, something like that. It's hard to get that get that across in a, in, in a, when you're writing an adventure. So, yeah, I can hear my dogs barking. Just one sec. I have to go let them okay. back in. So. All right. Um, so while he's doing that, I'm going to go check on uh, video check on Twitter. How are you guys doing in chat? Sorry, if we're uh, if we're not getting to your questions, just um, just go uh, just go shout at me or something like that. I will try and get to them. I'm trying to get through through them. Twitch is, does not have a great feature for. Uh, for uh you know sorting these things out um but i will answer that we'll see that this open-handed badger says new player issue heard from a game restore employee today in illinois uh about bad dm causing a shutdown to play for weeks took a while to find a group uh i don't know what the issue is um that i mean yeah bad dms or incompatible groups can kind of shut down play all the time but Play with your friends if you have not already. Check out Roll Twenty. Um, playing online is not something to be ashamed of, and uh, you get the added benefit of you actually get to choose who you play with. Um, uh, so I'm not, I'm not like, obviously don't just don't play with people who are not like uh, who are not fun or not enabling you to have uh, the fun that you want. You all good? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Go my dog. Cool, cool. <laughs> So this is this is an interesting question, and I actually wanted to discuss this because some people have mentioned it in chat. Um, have you, uh, Mike? Have you used any? Like, are you a proprietor of DMs Guild content? Um, not. I mean, yes and no. Um, we typically will use DMs Guild content. Um, I know we've just recruited a couple of writers from the DMs Guild, and I know we recruited a couple of writers last year. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't have the bandwidth to really go into it that's more like we do have a like a chris Lindsay is the guy at wizards who works with uh the the uh with one bookshelf the company that runs it and i know like chris chris perkins actually actually he came to me even looking at some of the content there and so we recruited a couple of writers to work on a future project with us. the um i have i have i have bought, bought a few things off of there and uh it's exciting to see you know, that was the entire point of it, right? Was to let people, like, if you want to write stuff in the Forgotten Realms, you want to, you know, use the like the full range of supplements and stuff for D&E &D to do your own thing. Uh, it's been really cool to, to, to see that take off, you know? And that was something that Chris Lindsay had really championed. And mm -hmm. uh, so it's been really cool to see it. The, um, for, you know, for, for me, what's also really, what's really interesting is, you know, I always take a look to see, like, what people are, are, are working on and, 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 and writing about. And we're actually looking at, you know, how are we ways which we can make dms guild you know even more prominent you know are there ways like for adventurers league that's like our official play you know shared mm -hmm. campaign can we integrate those two together you know and how could that work like right now you can buy the official adventurers league adventures on the dms guild but but you can only run those adventures in, in, you know as adventurers league material you know are there ways we can broaden that you know could we introduce some guidelines and things like that because it's been overwhelming to see the amount of uh the creative output uh it, it's been great so yeah um yeah. The, the, the i actually i mean i've used a few things from the dm's guild not a not a ton uh class wise there are some there's some interesting things like interesting ideas uh that are like 
there's some classes that clear a lot of work has been put into kind of building yeah. like completely new experiences and for a lot of others there's kind of, it's pretty clear that this is like this is an idea someone had and they just kind of jotted it down and you know threw it up there um but i think one of the things that i've gotten the most mileage out of dm's guild wise is the um the supplements for the adventure paths like yeah. uh I I got so much mileage out of all the like DMs or resources and stuff for uh, games like um, Out of the Abyss and stuff like that, you yeah. know, because th I think that's the content that like as a DM I go looking for is like okay I need an adventure so I need a, a thing to plug in because I don't have anything planned for the next story arc or something like that. Yeah, no, and actually I know from uh, from what we've seen sales wise, uh, your I'm glad you brought that up because that is borne out by what we've seen. Mm -hmm. uh, Sales wise, that yeah. things that are tied to what we've done uh, seem to get more, more downloads, more sales. The, um, it's actually kind of interesting. I'm on my iPad now, so I can't easily go to my PDF reader. But I know uh, I've looked at a couple of the character classes. Mm -hmm. There was one, I think it was, I think actually we featured it in Dragon Plus last year. It was like the, the Priestess or something like that. Uh, and it was basically like you had a giant idol that you could like animate. And, and, and like I just, I love wacky stuff like that. Yeah. I don't think we could ever get away with putting that in the player's handbook, but I like seeing what people are doing in their campaigns and really pushing boundaries. Uh, that's always fun. The um, there was kind of a, there was a cool take on like the hex blade someone did, um, uh, and they said there's been a few writers that we discovered. Like at least four people I know that we worked with in the past year. So two people we just brought on, two people mm -hmm. who worked with us last year. That like there was stuff in the guild that we had seen because uh, you know we'll, we track that we we get sales reports and sort of use that to sort of uh, I know Chris and Chris Lindsay and Chris Perkins use that to sort of start checking things out and just see like who they want to talk to. So yeah. Um, no, there's like uh, the adventure path stuff is uh, I I think is is always going to be um, the biggest you know the biggest draw because people kind of come into an adventure path and they're like oh this is cool like where you know what can I add to this you know what are other people yeah. do because also for me I think when I look at um, if you wait a couple weeks usually and then you look at what people are writing for an adventure path like what did people write for out of the abyss well they wrote lots and lots of encounters like um store little story segments that could happen during traveling you know that was those yeah. were the biggest sellers and it's like why well because that, that was probably the weakest point of that adventure was there was a lot of travel time and dms didn't know what to do with it um yeah. so looking at what what people are writing and sharing is always for me a good way of seeing where i'm gonna need to sort of to fix things as it, you know, when I, if I run this adventure. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cause otherwise you have to kind of suss that out yourself or in play. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's, you know, it's never fun. Um, Oh, this is, this is an inter interesting question. Not because mostly because I am completely neutral on this and I, I, I know it's pretty much, it's pretty much been talked to death. Um, but, uh, <laughs> Rackus back, uh, Rackus Bacchus, I says, um, how do you feel about DMs charging for their services? Uh, is there a reasonable option, or is it against the spirit of the game? No, I, I, I see the thing. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. You know, I don't know if I would do it myself, but like, you know, no one looks askance if like someone is playing music for a fee, right? Like, no one thinks it's weird if I write an adventure. If I write yeah. an adventure and I try to sell on the DMs Guild or just somewhere else, no one thinks that's weird. But if I run it for you, like, I know people can get fussy about it, but I think that's. To me, that's just, I, I guess I just don't see why people on principle would object to that. Because, I mean, I, there are yeah. plenty of things that, you know, <laughs> I, I vacuum my house for free. But if you want me to vacuum your house, <laughs> yeah, I'd expect well, to get paid, right? Well, <laughs> or, like, you're going to do something. Right? And so, yeah, I, I, I don't Now, I guess the one issue that I could see people having is you pay some, if you pay someone to DM, does that change the dynamic at the table? That's actually... Yeah. That's actually exactly what I, um, whenever this comes up, the only reason I don't, char I, or I, there's a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons I probably will never charge for DM services in the sense, like, be employed by someone as a dungeon master, even though I probably could, and I could probably charge a decent amount of money for it, um, I wouldn't because the idea that someone is paying me to do something changes the relationship dynamic. I like, yeah. uh, if you pay for something, you are in sort of entitled to it. Like if, if you pay for someone to wash your car or to, you know, do the, mow your lawn, you as the person employing them kind of get to tell them what, 
you know, what to do as far as that See, job goes, you know, right. and I don't, I don't ever want to give up that con like, I don't want a player being able to say, I don't like this. It, it happened like this thing that's happening right now. Nah, let's not do this. Let's do something else. Like I, you know, it's just a dynamic that I don't want at my table basically. But, but I, I think that's actually now we're about to get like way big picture, right? Whatever. I don't want to go too big picture, but <laughs> it, it's, it's something that socially, I don't know when this crept in. Like, my wife is a college friend, and, and I have friends who are professors. And it's interesting to see the, the attitudes people have today toward a college professor compared to when I was in, in undergrad. Now, I do not buy into this entire thing. Oh, it's millennials. And blah, right? that, that's stupid, right? That, that, no. that, this is, this is society-wide. Nowadays, if you go to McDonald's and you order a 99-cent cheeseburger mm -hmm. and you say onions and they give you onions... There are people who will like this is you know like they will be outraged right to them this yeah. is their chance to yell and scream and that's just like I think people just in general our society has like this really distorted sense of what it means to pay someone for a service you're paying someone for a service you're not paying them to be like your slave right <laughs> like like I'm paying you for a cheeseburger if you get my order wrong it's a 99 cent cheeseburger which maybe I shouldn't be eating anyways because I should be having a better diet, but whatever. <laughs> totally. Well, I mean... aside. But, but like, I, I, I need to like limit my outrage to 99 cents worth of outrage, which is to show you 99 cents of outrage is, Oh, Hey, you got my order wrong. Could you please replace my cheeseburger? Right. That's it. That's as angry as you're allowed to get. So if you take it to dungeon mastering or like more in your law, I'm like you wouldn't, if I, if you hired me to be your lawyer, right. And you said, okay, I want to sue this person. And I said, look, you have no grounds to sue them on. And you said, forget it. I just want to sue them anyway. I'm going to tell you, no, right? Like yeah. that's unethical. I'm not going to do that, right? And so I think we just get the sense that if people work for you now, like they like they have to do everything you say. And like I just think that's because we've culturally over the past thirty, I don't know, this entire customer is always right thing. I don't know where it's from, but yeah. people just have this really distorted sense of what it means to work for someone. Like you're doing a task for them within like reasonable quality constraints, not like. Hey, well, you know, if I hire you to mow my lawn, I don't expect you to take out a pair of scissors and like cut each blade of grass. Unless I paid you up front to do that and you're okay with it. But, you know, I just think people get this weird sense. And so I, th I don't yeah. think that's anything inherent to dungeon mastering. I think that's just something people, man, I don't know what it is. People get well, really worked up. You give them service and they, they flip out the smallest yeah. thing. There's also, there's also sort of that, that small, like, it's not necessarily true. Like as a DM, I'm not the iron fisted ruler of my gaming table but i you know there are certain precedents and there are certain things that as a dm like i every dm follower. does you know every dm kind of manages their table differently and it's like because i you know because i like i like the dynamic there i don't necessarily think that um you know putting myself in a position where someone might feel like they have that authority because they're paying for it, yeah. you know, to change with the content of their game. No, and that's they demand it. Like, you know, I wouldn't want to do that, and so I just, w I, I just wouldn't want to be involved in it. But I have no problem with people taking money to DM. I have no problem with people paying someone to DM for them. You know, by all means, do it if if it works for you and you can, you know, it's within your budget and you're having fun. You know, absolutely, I fully support it. Yeah, and I I can see how people think it's weird, right? It's like paying yeah. someone to be in your band, right? Like if I had a really yeah, crappy drive and and like, well, you know, we're pretty terrible, but we're gonna hire this guy, like you know, to be our singer because he's really good and maybe he's gonna make us all better. And you know, like I can see how that gets a weird dynamic. But yeah, I, I don't. The thing is, I think at the end of the day, if you were to tell me like five years from now, there are people making a full time living being dungeon masters, that'd be really cool, right? Like that would be like what? Like that's kind of cool to think about that like you're so good at dungeon mastering like that's what you do for a living like i don't know i think it'd just be cool to have a card that says professional dungeon master you know and so <laughs> i can't like i think i can't i think that's just like an in w really interesting world to live in where like D, &D is so yeah. popular that you can be like yeah what do you do for a living oh i'm a, I, I, I dm right it's i'm like, a dungeon master that's what i do now, you know now what do you, are you like at that point are you going around it's like okay so i got my first appointment at nine o'clock and then i have lunch and then yeah. i have a game in the afternoon <laughs> yeah. and then well, you know <laughs> right with with online games you could be like with time zones you'd be like okay i have to get up and at 10 o'clock i have to run a game for someone over in europe and then i'm gonna have lunch and then that evening i'm running a game with a group in japan like i can't well, find a lot 
Dungeon Masters, there we go, right? That's that's kind of what it is like to be a full-time D&D streamer on Twitch right now. I mean, yeah, right? I know, um, <laughs> I, not me personally, because I work a full-time job outside of a this, but um, I have a friend who is, uh, like, he went full-time. He's, he does two shows a day, six days a week, uh, like oh, wow. role-playing game, three-hour role-playing game shows, and it's, you know, it's a lot of work. It's kind of nuts. A lot. I don't yeah. think I could ever do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think I could either. <laughs> um, I could do the design stuff. I don't think I could do the actual DMing. Oh man, uh, there was a okay. So this is this is a question. Uh, photo, a couple of people asked, but uh, Photo Style says, uh, "Are is Wizards ever going to sell digital copies of the fifth edition books?" So um, I don't have anything to announce yet, but that's that's probably our the the the, the top uh, request we get. Mm -hmm. And so wait, wait, wait. No, I actually said this, so I, I can I can point to it. When you think of anything we're going to do, think to yourself, how can we do it to get as many new people into Dungeons and Dragons as possible? And that's again, so everything we do. So yeah, it's mm -hmm. just it's not as simple as like let's just put some PDFs out there, uh, which is cool. You know, I don't think it's PDFs, but we're kind of thinking about, we want a strategy that's going to be more like, you know, if we do anything, it's going to be hopefully be news with you know gaming websites, and I'll hope it'll draw it'll pull, pull new people into the game. So so I know it can be kind of vexing if you if you want your PDFs. I know a lot of people want their PDFs uh but just sorry just uh you know be, uh, hopefully you can be a little more you can be patient with us but you know we have we have plans we can't talk about it but we definitely will want to try, try to do something that's gonna be more driving even more players into D D. so yeah i mean i i'm a pdf guy um so i have been like desperately waiting because here, here's the thing <laughs> is I, bef I before i started streaming giving away these books i have a stack of physical books next to me i ne like i never use physical books anymore i haven't i haven't owned them <laughs> since third edition man uh so I, I i'm craving the the pdfs the searchable indexed you know linked pdfs um <laughs> Oh man! Uh, once again, guys, if you are, uh, we're taking a couple questions. We're taking questions and topics in chat. If you guys are just joining us, welcome to the Fuzzy Dice Show. I'm hanging out here with my good friend Mike Merles talking about D. &D. Howdy, everyone. Uh, we have. Uh, let me see how many how many retweets we're at. We're at 26. So just a couple more on there, and we will have our first unlocked giveaway. Um, and then stick around. Be sure to stick around for the uh, the end of the show because we have a big giveaway. Uh, that is being uh, it's being catered by our good friends uh, over at Wizards. They're sending us. They're gonna send you a big package of stuff. I got I got all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, I think there's a yawning portal book in there. I think there might be some cloth map in there. I think there might be some other goodies. So it's that's gonna be going on at the end of the show. So stick around for that. But if you have questions and stuff you want to ask us, just make sure you tag me or put the word question in front of it so I see it. Um, I don't understand quite understand this question, but I will say it anyway. Uh, Zipper on Disney says, "Give any insight on the strong save weak save design." Yeah, no. So I had to mute yourself. My dog's barking. That's yeah. Right. So that, that that's um. So yeah, we definitely we definitely know that there are three saves that are stronger than the other saves. So mm. con saves, X saves, and wisdom saves. Boy, does it suck if you have to make one of those and you fail. <laughs> Strength saves, intelligence saves, Christmas saves, you don't make as often. Mm -hmm. So we do con we do consciously try to, when we're designing a new class, give it one save from the first three, uh, amongst the first three, second save from amongst the the other three. And then as a class feature, you get, you get an, a, a new saving throw. Uh, if it's for the for that stronger group, we think of it, we, we cost it higher. We think of it as being more, more, more significant. It's actually, I'm going to be honest, a piece of game design I'm not happy with. I don't like the idea that you have to kind of figure that out. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you were to ask a new player, like, oh, through your six scores and you're making your saving throws, uh, you know, which one would you pick if you could only be good at one? And, like, how would you know that, right? Like, yeah. I've actually experimented my, my and I, I, I'm always messing with stuff. You know, like, I, I've, I've actually doing a completely different uh, uh, a save mechanic where it's just a saving throw. It's not tied to any ability score. I don't know if that would be... You know, if people would like that, I think people kind of like the flavor of you know, hey, my dwarf's really tough, it, so it's hard. Yeah, it, fe to it feels it feels people. a little less connected to the to the choices you make as a character. Yeah, but that was one of the advantages of having uh, in, in third and then in fourth when you had the defenses of mm -hmm. basically having three other stats uh, because then you knew they. I mean, but even then, I mean, I know back in the day, especially in third edition, 
you know, your reflex saves were nowhere near as important as your fortitude and will saves. You could pick, yeah. if you could pick, if someone's like, oh, I'm going to throw a curse on you and you're going to fail every single save at one type, you'd say, oh, right, of course, reflex, right? Because yeah. it's just damage, right? I can always just heal, heal my way out of it. But so even then, you know, it just gets, yeah, it's tricky. Do you, um, that's a, just real quickly, because I, uh, I'm actually interested in it. Um, I'm playing another game right now called Open Legend, which is, uh, basically uses a modified version of the defense system. Did you guys, I mean, did you find that the defense system in 4th edition was, like, completely horrible? Or was it actually working in, in a way that you, you kind of like? Because I happen to be a, a fan of it. So here's where it broke down, and it was really interesting. Um, what happened, and this is actually like a, a it's, it's interesting you asked about this, because this is actually a big principle of game design for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not applied in 5th consistently, because it's hard to do this. But I think if you can do it, it's great. I like to make things that are different look very different. And things that are the same, or, or that are that, that look the same, make them just the same thing. Mm -hmm. So the challenge we had with defenses was you'd say, "Okay, you have your armor class, and you have your, 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 your you have your defenses." It's a much more subtle uh, uh, mechanic than you think it is, especially for new players. So, for instance, if you're a fourth edition veteran, and I tell you, "Okay, you have you have two choices. You can either make a strength attack, a strength weapon attack against this guy's armor class." Or make it against his reflex defense, which follower. would you pick? Now, if you're a fourth edition player, of course, against his reflex, because I know it's going to be lower. Mm -hmm. But if you're a new player, you, you don't have know. no idea. Yeah. Like, how would I possibly know that difference? And then the other interesting thing, what happens is in the back, and this is actually a great example of the difference between design and implementation. Design would just say, hey, I want to have your armor, and then attacks against your armor, the basic melee attacks. Then I want to have a second set of defenses against things like poison and magic spells. I just go make that happen, right? Okay, implementers, now implement. And what happens is when... The nice thing with the saving throw system is it does make that physical attack look very different compared to everything else. Mm -hmm. If I'm casting a spell at you, it's a completely different procedure than if I'm trying to hit you with an arrow. Now, there are some spells in 5th... This is why I say it's not... And yeah. I like every design rule. It's not like, do this or else. It's more like, here's just a general direction. But what we found was in 4th edition, there was an enormous amount of rules overhead that went into making sure that those different, that the different attack types and the different defenses all functioned. Um, the way I like to think of it is, you can imagine a flow chart. In 5th edition, it's, is this an attack or a saving throw? So right up front, you have like one choice you have to make immediately. In 4th, it's like, oh, it's always an attack. But your second layer had like eight different things in it. Yeah. Where in the... The fifth edition of flowchart, you never get more than like, oh, right, it's a saving throw. Like, okay, like which type of save? Now you're done, right? Uh, this is like, okay, there's eight things. Now there's even more sub things you have to figure out. You know, like what type of attack is it? Now what's it? What's it against? And if it's against armor class, that's different than if it's against reflex. Than if it's than if it's a close attack versus a ranged attack versus. A, so it, it had a lot of complexity hiding beneath that seemingly much simpler front end. Um, and I think that then we then had saving throws embedded in the system uh, that made it even more like, okay, some things are save and some things aren't. Yeah. So uh, if, now I, that doesn't mean there's no truth there. There's nothing there that says like brief, you know, saving throws are just better. Like, no, it, it, I think that's just, it's working better right now. Yeah. If you were to tell me, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now in the theoretical sixth edition, we've gone back to defenses. I wouldn't be like, oh, impossible. I think, well, then something must've happened that made us, you know, either, uh, we found a, 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 a way we to do it that made it faster. And again, it goes back to the golden rule. Would this change make it easier for people to play D&D? Would it help bring new players yeah. in? Yeah. And what it would come down to? Yeah, that's, uh, I, I just, I mean, just because it was interesting for me, mostly because I now, I, I see other, other like, once D&D &D kind of got rid of it, I see other systems kind of picking it up in, in new and interesting ways, in ways that I, I would delve into now, but they'd take too much time to actually discuss the granularity of all that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we got, you know, it's not, we'll maybe do that another stream. Uh, so Zipper on Disney says, uh, we'll go through these real quick. Um, he <coughs> says, what is a class mechanic you miss from D&D &D next uh, or, or other testing, I guess, that m didn't make the cut? Uh, and are you planning on putting any of those back? Um, I don't think we'll put them back usually because they, they tested poorly. Uh, the one thing I miss the most, uh, it's, it's not a class feature, but it was rolling a die for your proficiency bonus. I really like that. And I'm mm -hmm. really like, I don't know why people didn't like it. It didn't test well, but I still really liked it. Wish it had worked. Cause I think it makes the game move much faster and it's much easier to teach, teach to new players. But I understand exactly why it's unsatisfying. You, no one wants say, to be. Oh, say, sorry. 
as an example, like if your proficiency bonus was say plus five, instead of adding five, you'd roll a d10 and add it to your result. People okay, yeah, that, that's what I was gonna say. Is it's you yeah. get it as a die and not a. Uh... Yeah. yeah, that's actually there's another um, the uh, the system that I'm playing on Saturdays uh, is the one that uses the defenses. Rather, they do a very it's a d20 system, a but rather than have like a, a you you put let's say you put four ranks in your profic- your perception right, um, mm-hmm. rather than get a plus five or whatever you get plus a new follower you know 1d6 2d6 1d8 2d8 you know cool. and it scales the more points you get so you're 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 rolling more dice and the reason that that works is because it's an exploding dice system means so you're you re-roll highest follower. numbers um you know and add them together but i i like that because it's it's there's very like there's math at the end but the actual you know the the middle part is fairly easy you just pick up dice and roll them yeah, and I especially like the idea that if you're playing a new player, you can see immediately if, if they if they haven't added their their proficiency bonus, right? Yeah. If you see, see someone just roll one die, you're like, wait, yeah. you need to roll a die and add it to what you rolled. But uh, it's again the entire idea. No, make I, things I get look it. Different that, but but yeah. Um. So Rockus Bacchus says, uh, "What is your most memorable character death moment?" Oh, memorable characters. I, actually, no, I haven't had many characters die. Neither, I don't know yeah, if neither have I. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I'm like good at D&D or I'm, like, I'm a really boring player. The, uh, I, I'll tell you the most memorable character death when I was DMing. My favorite story of murdering an entire party of characters was uh, in, uh, in AD&D 2nd uh, Edition. If you played back then, you might remember that the, the trick with illusions was they didn't make any sound. If you wanted an illusion to make sound, you had to cast another, a higher level yeah. illusion spell. Well, at one point, the party uh, were playing for this adventure. The characters are chasing this evil cleric of Bane and his ogre bodyguard up this dungeon passageway. It's a cave complex, and it's it uh, it's this really steep passage heading upward. And the party's running after him, and he's up ahead with his ogre. And the evil cleric and his ogre get to the top, and there's a boulder up there that's that's covering up the at the exit from this this cave complex. And so, it just randomly, I decide, hey, you know what? He's going to have the ogre roll this big rock down the passage at the, the characters to slow them down. And as I was deciding that, I look and realized, hey, this cleric has a silence spell. Who's going to throw it on the boulder? Why not, right? Just, <laughs> hey, who knows what'll happen? I wasn't even thinking he was going to try. I was just like, oh, just he'll throw it on there because it'll surprise him. So when I tell the players, you see this enormous boulder rolling down the, the, the passage toward you, and you notice though it's not making any noise, they said, oh, okay, we'll just keep running. It's Clearly, an illusion. <laughs> it's an illusion. <laughs> I love- <laughs> And then, yeah, I basically, we, that was the session where we had to figure out, okay, so if you're at zero hit points or, or negative hit points in the second edition and no one's there to heal you, what happens, right? We had to like actually look the one of the few times I ever looked at a rule up playing AD&D because they just made it all up as I went. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. And it ended up with one character crawling back to town. Uh, and I think half the party died, but the other half they managed to, to recover. Yeah. So I, um, the most memorable character death for me, I haven't had, I haven't, I have a, a curse where a lot of my old like before I started DMing, a lot of my campaigns didn't last very long, uh, mostly because the groups broke up. You know, they did, whatever. Um, we we didn't play all that long. But um, I was pl- we had played with this DM, and he was a great DM f- for some things. He was really good at NPCs. Like he could make NPCs that you would love to talk to for you know for hours on end. He was not very good when it came to fights um, <laughs> because he had a habit of like just made like cheating i guess is the word uh so um here so we're walk we're in this dungeon we're level three uh we've made it to level three and we're in this dungeon i'm playing a a, a fighter who uses a pole arm and his thing is like he's all based around the ability to trip people with this pole arm uh mm-hmm. and he can like he can handle himself in a fight because of that um he's really high dex he's you know he's he's a cool character um, and so we're in this room, we're getting into this room. Now there's a one tile wide stairway leading down in the room. So I'm in the front cause I'm the fighter and everyone else is behind me. And I guess we have a, we have a rogue that's like stealthing around the corner. And the, the DM decided that even though this rogue rolled a 40 on a stealth check, I think something like that, mm-hmm. the, uh, the guard spotted him and not sent out the alert, but instantly all four of the rooms with enemies in them were right in, right in combat. Oh, wow. Like, <laughs> he just picked the tokens up and put them there, and he's like, now you're in combat. And so my, my character is, like, with his polearm, and he's surrounded by people and rats, and he's trying to fend them off. 
we might have stood a chance, except for the fact that the wizard behind me, and one step behind me, sees this melee of combat, does not see that my character is in the middle of it, color spray. Oh. And so <laughs> instantly the fighter went unconscious because of color oh, spray, no. and we just got overrun in a second, and we all died, and I, that, it was memorable because for, I, I've been playing with that, um, the guy who was playing the wizard for like four years now, and he's never been allowed to play a caster ever since. <laughs> for so, good reason. Uh, that was, I think, probably the, the only real interesting character death I've ever had, where I got color sprayed by my own party. Uh, oh, man. We gotta, well, let's take a couple more questions. Um, and then we're gonna we're gonna reserve some time to do our, our giveaway and stuff. So real quick, rapid fire. Uh, our green paradox says campaigns seem to be getting to higher character levels more often. Uh, are you guys sort of writing this into your design model? Uh, yeah, we're actually looking at ways that we had just addressing this right now. What could we do to support high, high level play? Uh, do more content, m more stuff aimed at it. Uh, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg. Most people don't get to high level. But we also think part of that's because we don't have as much content for it. So I think uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see us uh, in the next couple of years to see more stuff to support um, play at higher levels. Yeah, um, I love uh, I love when there's a, sort of a diversity of, of modules and content and stuff to uh, to span um, all different. You know, so not everyone wants to start at level one. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Judo Killer says, uh, this, is, this is an interesting question, it says, uh, what, do you have a sort of a mo most memorable gaming moment, sort of a battle, a great role-playing moment, a puzzle, uh, an awesome item, just, some, just something that sticks out to you as a, as a highlight? Oh, wow. So, whew, where, where to begin, right? The, I, I think one of the most memorable things for me in my current campaign has been... Um, so in my current campaign, there aren't any gods. There's just devils and angels. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, the characters went to the temple of, of the Nine Hells, and they met a high priest, and he was this kind of scheming guy. He was trying to, to work with them. And he said, well, if you sign this contract with hell, I can give you the help. And I don't think the guy had even finished the sentence. But like, okay, we're signing it. I was like, <laughs> oh, okay, oh, wow. That just got interesting fast. That escalated quickly, right? Okay. Uh, that was definitely very, very memorable. Um Another time was um, it's almost kind of, it's actually funny. Uh, it's, well, depending on where where you were, were sitting at the table, it was funny. Uh, we were playing through a campaign. Um, we had a halfling thief in the party. This was back in AD and D days, uh, and he got killed. I think we we're we we're traveling through the forest. We we're moving between towns. Like during this war, we got ambushed by hobgoblins, and he got hit by a bunch of arrows and was killed. Uh, I'm like, oh, this is really terrible. But you know what? We can't afford to carry his body with us because we're trying to move really quickly. So we'll just bury the character here. And all the time, all this time, my friend who played the, the halfling was just really looking mad, right? Like his character died. And he seemed upset by that. But we started talking about burying his body. He just looked really, really mad. Like he was getting really upset. But he said it. And the DM said something like, well, you can't say anything. Just don't say anything. Like, what the heck? What the heck's going on? It's like, okay, whatever. We bury, you know, we, we quickly dig a grave, throw him in, bury him, move onward. And then, like, when we get to the city, like, the next day, he's, like, takes that player to the side, and they, like, do something for 20 minutes. And he comes back, and says, okay, you made it to the town, and then the next day, the halfling shows up, all, like, bedraggled. And it turned out he had stolen the ring of regeneration that we thought was on the fighter and was wearing it. So, <laughs> like, we didn't, we hadn't gotten any fights, the fighter hadn't taken any damage, we didn't know he was stealing from everyone else in the party, and we found out because being actually nice guys, we didn't just loot his body, we buried him with his stuff. And we didn't notice that the ring he was wearing was the fighter's ring. And he had other party members' magical items in his pockets, too. So, so that was an awkward moment. And then my final memorable moment, I was running a game of Call of Cthulhu. And I was playing, I was with my players. And we had this very rickety, long, narrow card table we were playing on. And I was sitting at the head of the table. And the players, you know, we have lights turned down, make it nice and creepy. It's a horror role-playing game. And I'm just the play. I'm describing the scene to the players as they're like creeping into the, like this this attic of this haunted house, and I'm there's a ghoul hiding up there, and I decide the ghoul's gonna drop down, you know, and land on these like crank these creaky old old, old old floorboards in the attic with a big bang. But I realize I'm thinking this like you know what I can do the way I'm sitting, I can kick the table from beneath it. Oh shit. Like, <laughs> leaning forward right they have their elbows up on the table so when i say you hear aloud and i kick the table and it leaps and everyone screamed and freaked out they had totally caught them by surprise it was like one of my best dming moments ever 
was surprising them at that ghoul by, by kick the table left and everyone went flat and they just all screamed in terror. Like it was fantastic. Totally caught him by surprise. Oh man. I did something similar to that. Not in a horror game, but, um, my, uh, my, one of my players had this fantastic moment that just threw the whole story, uh, to the side when they were in a, they were in a vampire temple called the feasters of the heart and they were at the bottom of the temple, and there was just a heart and a gold pan for vampire rituals, as you have, you know, yeah. it's just scenery. Those, yeah. He is a barbarian obsessed with gaining power, so he doesn't look weak. So he, what does he do when they offer him power? He walks right up in the middle <laughs> of the fight, grabs the heart, and takes a giant bite. And so I had to, over the next week, I had to, like, find, a, a like, he has a partial vampire template now. Like, he, you know, he has some major drawbacks, but he has some cool powers. But the most important thing is that he now serves the most powerful vampire in the city. Uh, and he knows cool. that he does because they've spoken. Uh, oh, that's and great. So, so he was in the middle of the, he was in the middle of the city at night. They were running from the law and he just like, he was being chased down by like 13 guards. Um, and all of a sudden the, the, the mist rolls in around him in this plaza as the guards are closing in and they just get slaughtered. Right. And the, the, mm-hmm. the vampire steps out of the mist. And this guy is just, you know, the vampire's talking to him, very calm, very collected. And he is a, he's, his character is very cocky, you know, very kind of forward. Uh, and so he's, like, talking back to him. And just, it was, we were just having a civil conversation. And all of a sudden, I, mean, I have the backup from my mic. I'm just like, Hell! And he's like, <laughs> oh, shit, what is going Like, he literally, like docile like a dog after that <laughs> and i'm like awesome. uh you know that's he, he respected the power dynamic after you, you scare players a little bit um <laughs> oh man i love doing that i wish i i wish i had more opportunities to like kick tables from under players. <laughs> i miss it man i miss it um we had uh so we have a uh, that was actually uh actually a really cool i think a really cool question to end on because uh, we are coming up to ten o'clock right now. We uh, okay. we have some other stuff to get to get through. Um, so, b- like, first and foremost, uh, before we kind of start wrapping things up, I want to I want to t- thank you guys for coming out and asking all of your questions, and thank you, Mike, for being here and for uh, for taking the time out of your day to to hang out with us and talk, share your insight, and answer all these the uh lovely viewers questions yeah. and, and topics like that um so thank you so much i hope you had a good time i know i certainly did oh, oh i, I agree i don't hear my dogs the dog yeah the dogs too. had a great time <laughs> <laughs> well you know, thanks thanks for taking time thanks for inviting me on i had a great time thanks for who turned out ask great questions i had a really great time absolutely uh we're not do- we're not done just yet though guys don't go running away because first as i promised you we have a big old giveaway a big fat giveaway um, for you guys. So let me find it here. What, here's, what's going to happen. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to make a command. It's going to be exclamation point Y P. That's going to be the big, uh, yawning portal giveaway that we're going to do. I promise you at the end of the night, we'd have a big giveaway. That's going to be coming to our winner. It's got a brand new copy of this here book right here. Uh, we've got a cloth map for you. We've got some. Pro- I'll probably throw in some dice because I'm a nice guy. Uh, it's you know it's gonna be. And there's also some other cool D and D swag. So here's what's gonna happen. I am gonna start this. Dice is gonna start it right now. And all you guys need to do is type exclamation point YP to enter. Uh, and we'll give you a little bit of time to get in on that. But make sure you do. If you haven't already, now is a good time to hit that retweet link. I don't know how many we are away, but um, I promised if we hit some of those goals, I would throw in something else. We're about a little over 10. We're about 10 retweets away. So if 10 of you guys hit that retweet link, I will give away something else because, uh, you know, I just have a lot of stuff here and I need to get it out of my my room. Uh, <laughs> I, I buy I I bought bulk D and D books and now they're just taking up so much space. I have dice. I have all kinds of stuff. I don't know. I don't even. I can't and I can't keep any of it. Um. <laughs> so exclamation point YP. Thank you guys for following. If you haven't already, thank you guys for joining us. Um, get follower. in on that giveaway if you have not. It's exclamation point YP in the chat. I'm gonna give you guys just a bit of time to get going with that. There is the retweet link if you haven't already retweeted it. Um, 
And uh, no, 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 no. Um, also, oh, a big shout out and a big thank you to Twitch for uh, for having us and for hosting us on the front page. If you guys don't know already, Twitch is doing a um, a tabletop role playing game spotlight. They do it like once a month uh, with a couple with a whole bunch of different streams representing different aspects of the very very awesome tabletop role playing game community here on Twitch. Uh, some of my great friends are been featured. Some of my uh, you know the, obviously they lowered their standards enough to have us on, which. <laughs> You know, uh, but thank you, Twi big thank you to Twitch for putting that together. Okay, so I'm just gonna, we're just, I think that's, that's enough time. You think that's enough time? I think that's enough time. Um, so he, uh, da -da -da -da, where are we? Give away, give away. Last second to get in, guys, and then I'm gonna stop entries. I know I'm saying that now, but it's 30 seconds delayed, so, um, so while while we're doing that, I guess Mike, do you want to uh, do you want to t get I guess tell people a little bit about where uh, what you get up to online, where they can find you, you know, any cool any cool things you they should check out uh, that Wizards is doing right now, or that you'd like to uh, you'd like to, to promote or plug. Yeah, so the best place to get in touch with me is on Twitter. I'm uh, Mike Merles, all, all one word: M I K E M E A R L S. Uh, though lately, uh, I've been sick. That's why I'm actually my house rather than the office today. I've been out sick the past couple of days. Uh, so my, my reply time is a little bit slower than usual. Uh, and then uh, dnd.wizards.com is our website. We post uh, news and everything there uh, usually every Monday. Well, every Monday for this month and then monthly beginning uh, in May. Uh, we'll have Unearthed Arcana and other features. And then there's also Dragon Plus. Uh, it's just the word dragon with a plus sign after it. Uh, that's our sort of online uh, magazine web, uh, app. You can download or check out the web, and that's the the best. Those are the best places to hit up for D and E news. Absolutely, um, and oh my God, last in the la at the last second, my f my good friend Unmade Gaming comes in with the fifty five person host. Holy shit! Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and shout out Unmade Gaming. There you go. If you guys have not checked them out, uh, Unmade Gaming is a uh, a great community. Friends, they're friends of mine. And they just got done playing their own game of D and D tonight. Uh, so if you guys have not checked it out, they are awesome streamers. They've got a great community and some really, really great content. So make sure you go follow them. If you guys are here from Unmade, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a tip. Type exclamation point YP in the chat right now. You a get in on follower. a big ass giveaway that we're going to, uh, we're going to go do. And also you can, uh, you can get some retweets in there to help get that second giveaway going. Um, but thank you, Mike. And yeah, go check out the, uh, the dungeon, uh, dungeon plus all the, all of that good stuff. And by the way, thank you uh, to the guys running the uh, the Dice Camera Action Show for that shout out earlier today. Those guys are awesome, man. Um, all right, cool. So I'm gonna go. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna cl <laughs> close this giveaway in just a second. I should have done it <laughs> earlier. Um, if you guys, I'll I'll do my own shout out. If you guys have not already followed me, my name is uh, exclamation point social. My name is Askren. I am your host and dungeon master here on Exploding Dice, where we have live role playing uh, D and D twice a, well three times a night only two of those campaigns are D&D 5th edition one of them is uh we have our Saturday game which is our Rising Moon our open legend horror campaign uh which is so much fun it's so gory and mysterious and I love it uh then we have Sunday which is Jade Regent our 5th edition adventure campaign and we just started a brand new campaign on Wednesdays that is Iron Gods another D&D 5th edition campaign lots and lots of great role-playing content for you to check out if you have not already you can get all the information you follow the channel here on Twitch uh, you will get alerts whenever we go live. And you can follow me on Twitter. It's just at Askren. And I, that's where all of the official information goes. So here's the deal. I'm going to... Uh I'm going to end this little giveaway thing right now because it's been going on for a while. So here we go. Ending the giveaway. If you have not got in, sorry guys. But there it is. So let me get a drum roll going as we pick the winner. Let's get some ED, uh, ED cheer or ED hype or... Just ED love in the chat. Those are our custom emotes. And we're going to pick a winner. I am going to pick not one, but because I'm a nice guy, I'm going to pick two winners because the second runner-up is not is going to get from me a, new a brand new D&D &D player's handbook. I'm throwing I'm throwing one in. So that's how, that's how it's going to go. Uh, so here we go. Pick winner number one. I am copying and pasting a that and picking follower. winner number two. So, guys, let me get some ED love in the chat, ED hype, because the first winner is 
Mr. Sorry. A new follower. Where did it go? Oh, there we are. Uh, okay. So, the first winner of the, uh, the Yawning Portal giveaway is... Judo Killer! Oh my god, Judo Killer! Thank you for entering, my friend. Judo Killer, you have won that big, big Yawning Portal, uh, gift basket. So, make sure you get in touch with me for that. The second winner, of course, is... Looks like it's going to be Ishman... 223 Ishman, you have got yourselves a brand new player's handbook. Judo, you are going to be receiving that big yawning portal packet. So thank you guys. Show some ED cheers in the chat. You guys know how to get in touch with me uh, for all of that stuff. I will have it shipped out to you at some point. Um, but seriously, that is that's gonna be it. That is all we got for today. Thank you so much for the uh, the hype raids, the hosts. Thank you to Twitch, and of course, huge thanks to Mike Merles uh, for hanging out with us. I had a great time. I hope all of you guys did. Thank you for coming out. Uh, we're gonna get out of here, but I think should we go? Should we go? We should we should raid someone. I think we should. Um, let me uh, because you know what what better way to pass the love on than that. I'm looking for someone here that is streaming and I'm gonna go crash their stream right now. Um, shoot, who's who's streaming right now? <laughs> Guys, help me out here. Uh, who's streaming in the Dungeons and Dragons category? Where are we here? Over, you know what? We're going to go crash overboard gaming because why not? So that's that's where we're going to go, guys. Uh, here is the link. Exclamation point. Raid. Overboard gaming. They're playing their Natural Ones campaign. I don't know how long that's going to be going on. Holy shit, I lost Mike. I lost his video, but he's still here. No, it's, he's still here. Um, so let me... Uh, no, I don't want flipping that burgers. I don't want the flipping that burgers. So, uh, we, we lost you for a second. That's all right. Uh, anyway, we're uh, the link is in chat. Go ahead and raid, uh, exclamation point, raid Overboard Gaming. We're going to host them in just a second. Uh, we'll see you next time, guys. Don't, be, uh, don't forget to stop by tomorrow at 8 p.m. Eastern for Iron Gods. A new follower. Uh, we'll, we'll be there playing some D&D. &D. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mike. We'll see you next time, guys. But as always... Don't let Dice Thulu get his tentacles on you because he gets very handsy when he does. We'll see you next time, guys. Thank you for hanging out. Take care, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye.